Hello, my name is Reverend Paul, and this is The Journey of the Heart. The Journey of the Heart is a do-it-yourself ministerial kind of boot-up process. The, um, the idea is I am trying to put more than uh, 20 years of my own experience in ministry and in mediating the experience of the divine in my life into a capsule. And this is the capsule that you have discovered here. And this capsule is going to be so dense. There's so much information in this. It's pretty rambly. Uh, it's not a structured like textbook. It is a bunch of stories. It's a bunch of ideas. Uh, all of these concepts and ideas are meant to inspire you to connect with perhaps some of your own experiences and to provide informational bridges for you uh, in terms of like for further exploration. I think, I believe, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I was a college professor for a number of years formally, but I'm always teaching. If you hang out with me for more than like three or four minutes, I'll probably try to teach you something. Uh, <laughs> I just can't help it. And the, the what I can't help is inside my heart, I feel such a profound light and joy in, um, in uh, the connection that I experience to um, light or to the divine or to God inside. Uh, when I'm in that connection, I, in addition to enjoying it, I also just think endlessly about how to express it and how to explain it and how to encourage more people to, uh, to have the experience themselves. Uh, <laughs> this, I, I am, I am a fast talker, so I just apologize for that up front. I'm sure I'm going to drive a lot of you crazy with my, with my, the way my brain works. Um, I also, um, I, I just want to say that the, the best case I could find for this, for this content would be that it, it connects you to your own um, experience of love in your heart and that it inspires you to take that deeper. My, one of my goals here is to completely demystify um, what being a minister is. I think it's something completely normal, something natural. It's something I was called to uh, without any special prompting, I guess, uh, on my, my local personality self. I had to figure out a way to, to show other people what God was, like how they get to it, how they sustain it, um, and, and how they can just unfold it and ultimately share it with other people. I don't think that there's any one set way to do it. I think that it's best when it's fun and it's deep and it's powerful. Um, it can be serious in the sense that it's for everything. It's for, it's for the times when we feel our connection to the divine works and we need it the most when we're the most in when we are the saddest, when we're in, when we're in despair, when there's great challenges in the world. Um, but it's also this relationship that can happen during the joyful times and during just regular work days. I, I try to spend as much time as I can. Um, I don't try to spend as much time as I can. I do spend as much time as I can just connecting with and uh, trying to be fluid with my waking natural consciousness and that presence of the divine inside. Over the years, I've had Lots of students, both formal and informal kinds of students, ask me, you know, like, how do I do it? How do I get to the divine? Um, Paul, you're um, always talking about God. You're always talking about your connection to God. And, and I want that. I want that connection for myself. I get it. I understand. I, um, it is the most important thing. It's the most critical thing. And it's in short supply in the West, uh, at least formally, at least in terms of you have to go looking for it in the West. In the East, I've done a bit of traveling and um, study and prayer in India. In India, it's everywhere. It, it, it literally is just dripping from the walls. It's in every child's eyes. It's, uh, it's, just, a, it's just a continuous presence. Uh, the, everybody is very actively uh, connecting with and uh, being a part of uh, trying, to, trying to get closer to the divine. In, in the East, they say, uh, when you see God, run for it, like as in pursue it with your whole heart. So the, for, this is made mostly for Westerners though. <laughs> I mean, cause I'm a Westerner. So that's my, that's probably my, the people who are going to get me the most. Um, a little bit about myself. I uh, was born in the Midwest. Um, I was born on a farm. Um, 
I uh, lived in, I, I, I've had several different pursuits and I've lived in several different places, but um, in general, my roots are under the plains of Kansas. I, I, when I was very young, I remember just being enthralled by the stars and the presence of um, just a, a familiar consciousness. Um, uh, there was something bigger than me that was right over my head. And um, I remember being outside as a child and just falling in love with the depth of the sky. Um, I lived on a small farm in very rural Kansas. And so you could see a lot of stars and you could see a lot of light because there was almost no light pollution when I was born. I was born in 1976. And um, it was, uh, I was, I was born um, in this to, to, to two very simple people uh, that were um, pretty poor. Uh, we started off uh, very, uh, we did not have a lot of money, but there wasn't a lot of concern about that um, when I was a, when I was a kid, and um, so anyway, I, I think I auto got a little autobiographical there for a moment. But uh, yes, the, just that that na that natural sense of wonder and play that I experienced as a child, just how the trees and the forest and the the animals and the land and the water and all of it it can just it speaks to you when you're a child and it talks to you and that's a common experience uh, for uh, for child people in their childhoods and the reason why i believe that that communication can take place is because our brains are in a particular state of consciousness we uh, call it a theta state of consciousness, uh, the theta brain wave being one particular frequency of, of the brain working, is the same frequency that you have when you dream. So if you think about what a dream is, everybody dreams, um, everybody has multiple dreams each night. A dream is a, a completely solid other reality. It's a, it's a world that exists separately from this world, but yet the symbols and some of the lessons can tie into this world. So in, in a lot of ways, um, ministry is becoming a bridge between perhaps an altered state of consciousness that is a, a direct connection with the divine and everyday life. And a minister is a person who feels like they love, they just love that state of consciousness so much, and they love the 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 living, um, personal uh, being that they experience in the divine, and they want to share that. They want to they want to connect other people to it, mostly just out of joy. Uh, um, not, I mean, you, I guess you can get religious about it and have uh, a greater mission that would come from politics, maybe, or from something else, but. The true, the true calling for it is, is that just wanting to share it and wanting to share it because it's so wonderful. Uh, this is, a, I'm offering, um, I offer this part, the journey of the heart. This is my um, kind of core ministerial teaching, um, what do you call those things? It's not a cauldron because I'm not that much of a witch, but it's a, what do you call those? A crucible where you have a, like just a focused, a focused container that can like pour, you can pour like molten lava inside of there. This, that's what this is for me. Um, I, I like to give this one away. I like this one to be available everywhere because I think about myself when I was 16 years old and I saw God for the first time and I didn't have that many resources and I, I wouldn't have had a lot of access to cash or even a, even a structure to kind of join something. So um, it's my hope that this finds its way to my 16 year old self out there somewhere. Somewhere out there, there is a young person or a middle-aged person or an old person. Someone has received the call. Someone has been like, wait, what is ministry? What is that thing? And how does it actually work? And I, what I wanna do is I wanna put in this crucible, I wanna put all the resources that I have accumulated, at least as many of them as I can talk in a few hours. Uh, my This recording method that we're using has a couple hours of record time. We are in my light lab, also known as my garage, and uh, we've got a beautiful um, evening here in Evergreen, Colorado, which is where my home is. Um, I live here with my wife of, of 20 years. Uh, my wife is also a, a minister, and um, we have um, we have 
this meant much of what you're going to experience with me as we go through this comes from 20 years of deep, wonderful conversation and experience um, doing just what I was describing, trying to uh, trying to bring some piece or the, the wisdom, the insight, the, the inspiration from that inner place um, out into the world. The, uh, to become a minister, you know, there's all kinds of ministerial training programs that you can go through. Uh, I've gone through several. I've gone through more than five in my life, and um, I have gained wisdom from each one. Part of, my, part of my goal here today is to try to share some of the gems from those different paths that, I have, that I've walked and, uh, and also relate that to how it, how it helps me stabilize and communicate and connect with the experience of God. I'm just going to use the word God. I, I don't mean to draw any offense from anybody. I don't mean to trigger anybody's uh, um, cultural conditioning around the rightness or the wrongness of that. When I say God, I mean the thing that's at the heart of all the things. <laughs> like any leaf, any tree, any being, uh, any being, uh, animal, plant, mineral, um, has a connection to it. And enlightened souls, like saints of all the traditions, all the religious traditions, they express the same kinds of, of insights of what, what is that thing and why is it important to know it. Um, when you look back into antiquity and you look into um, uh, more simple cultures, hunter-gatherer societies, at least the anthropology that we've been able to do at, to, to like what has survived into the 21st century and, and back when we were doing recordings, um, you know, there's there are commonalities. There are commonalities in how holy people throughout time have accessed the divine and how they have communicated it. And those holy people are, are the, they're the hub in many, in many cases of, of society. And we, people who try to do ministry now, you get a rough, there's a, it's a rough ride. But uh, in my theory, and this is all just my own personal experience. So, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, uh, take it with a grain of salt. And if it inspires you to look into it for yourself, that's the gold right there. Looking at, um, connecting these random concepts <laughs> that I, that I put forward here with your own experience. And, and that's when it becomes real. Um, I'm going to lay out a lot of philosophy as I go through this thing, but in general, I would like, if I heard, that one person out there had listened to some of my crazy ramblings here and they had it had inspired them to look inside for themselves and they had found their way into that inner kingdom of God that's within us and it had it had inspired them to go through the a discipline perhaps the rigor the joy the ecstasy of making that personal connection and then sustaining it this entire thing would be worth it I will suffer 10,000 fools for the one um, person who can establish that connection for themselves and uh, not just establish it, but I have met so many people who have little pieces of it, who have had a flash insight of God, who were on LSD or um, more recently, tons of kids of uh, young people have talked to me about uh, DMT and their DMT experiences and how they have these flash insights of connectivity and the oneness of creation. This chalice here that we're making, this can be a um, like a toolkit for how to unpack that, how to get perhaps back into that state of consciousness um, um, without the use of drugs or um, ethnogens or anything like that. I think those things can help, especially initially when you open to open to an experience. But I, I also think that it's important for to be able to just do it all the time. I I initially had my first opening experience under the influence of LSD, and that was a extremely spiritual thing for me. the The result was a connection with the divine and with everything. Uh, but it, I, f subsequent trips that I took using LSD didn't recreate that for me. So it's not so. It doesn't. It's not just the plant. It's not just the chemistry. It's a, it's a combination of the the heart and it's what it really is is the the individual soul. What in the 
in uh, Hinduism, they call the Sita, the individual soul, wanting to connect with the Ram, with the with the great being. So this is a this is a process. The journey of the heart is something that we all have to do eventually. In my estimation, when I look at like souls and their project their progress over time, we all have to. It all has to come down to a personal practice and to a personal connection that we feel with the divine. And um, Journey of the Heart is an attempt to bottle up some uh, some techniques and some inspiration and some stories uh, for your particular personal journey. Uh, we've got some hummingbirds outside here. I uh, have the garage door open at least for a couple more hours before we lose the sunlight. And um, I'm already off to a wonderful rambling start. So I here's how I would suggest you do this in small pieces. <laughs> you know, you can probably take 10 or 15 minutes of me talking. Just save your place in the file. Come back to it later. Um, most likely you have found this file as part of a map. Uh, I consider this to be... Um, there's a concept called a Socratic circle that I was very fond of using when I was a college professor. And the concept is you have a text and then everybody reads the text and then people come, uh, you come to a Socratic circle with a set of questions. Everybody, one person might ask their question and then everybody answers the question. This is, uh, if you follow the map that this thing is embedded in, you'll find little areas where you can think about, contemplate, um, digest, uh, and um, put forward your own inspirations because this is this is supposed to be interactive. I mean, dear Lord in heaven, if if the experience of God can't be interactive in an educational sense, nothing can be. This is like this is the one the, the one thing that like every being can experience for themselves and should experience for themselves. And uh, um, I just want to I just want to encourage everyone to to apply uh, the what we're what we're going through here. So, journey of the heart. Um, the whole thing is based on. Oh, maybe we should. Maybe I should give you a little. We were talking frame for a second. Okay, so this thing is being recorded in a 360 format that lets you be here in my lab with me. Uh, I like this format because my favorite way of watching this content is on a headset. So. If you have access to uh, to a VR headset, you can download the file and you can basically put on a headset like this. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this tech, um, there are in this room here. I've got sensors. These sensors project essentially grids of light, and those grids of light feed into the headset. And they what they do is they the information from the headset is. Reverend Paul is looking this way, and now I'm looking this way, and now I'm looking this way, and now I'm looking up. So. It is the ultimate intrinsic classroom in terms of recorded. If I recorded this in like a standard format, uh, you could turn it on and you've probably been trained since birth to ignore a little bit um, frames or at least to think of frames as something static. I find that the 360 format, you can't, you, if you are in a headset, you cannot ignore the, um, you have to choose. It has to be you who decides. So if I go over here, you're going to have to do some little bit of work on whatever device that you're using in order to be able to uh, to kind of follow me there. So um, let me get an adjustment here. Like if you're on a cell phone, you can let me do this here. If you're on a cell phone uh, and you're watching this video, you can move the cell phone around. If you're on a browser, on a desktop computer, you can click and drag. That's a kind of interaction. You can also take the cell phone and you can put it into its own headset, uh, something that looks kind of like this. You, you, drop, you drop the cell phone in here. You kind of button this thing up. You have to get one that matches your cell phone. And then you put it on like this. And then what happens is the uh, accelerometers and the various sensors in the cell phone, when you turn around, it, it essentially feeds that information into the software and says the viewer is pointing their heads this way and that way. <laughs> uh, just go with the best tech that you have. If you only have a browser, that's fantastic. You could probably get quite a bit from this, honestly, from listening to it in audio as well. Uh, we've got the images here. We've got, uh, I've got two screens. I know we're getting some bounce back from the light outside. Hopefully this one here, you can see what's going on. Um, I am a 501c3. 
I am a, uh, a priest in my own 501c3 called the Order of Mary. My mission is to um, ecstatically teach and express God's what God inspires me to share with the world and to encourage other people to pursue their own connection with the divine. And for those special people who feel called to really make it their life, to make it like a core part of who and what they are, to, um, to provide resources for them to become ministers. So legally, ministry. Okay, so a little bit more on the legal stuff. I'm a 501c3. Um, this is being offered for free. Uh, it is educational in nature. Under U.S. copyright law, that means that all the images and all the stuff that I use here uh, is um, basically fair use. So I, uh, it's, it's important for me to follow, like, I don't know, I'm following a lot of the rules. I Also, in the United States, we have the First Amendment, and the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. There is a separation of church and state in the United States of America. What you are experiencing here is a licensed, registered minister, like speaking about the nature of reality and God uh, to the world, hopefully. Uh, hopefully this thing gets around. And um, I can't think of speech that should be protected under our First Amendment more than this than this particular speech. Because if you... if if the reason why we established the United States of America and the Constitution and all of it was to provide religious protection and religious um, religious freedom. That's what drew all of the people who established the United States here in the first place. That's how we got the Puritans. They were kicked out of England because they were too freaky serious about their, uh, their beliefs. And so they came here and they practiced. The early Quakers, um, loads and loads of religious groups come to the United States in order to do this kind of thing. So for me to uh, perform legally, like a marriage as a minister, a uh, baptism, um, uh, a funeral, you know, to help facilitate perhaps a conscious divorce or something along these lines, to, to be in a ministerial role, you, um, and, uh, you know, to sign the birth certificates or to sign like a, um, a marriage certificate or whatever you're being asked to do as a minister, there's going to be local laws in your particular area. Uh, my, this, this 501 C3, C3 chapel, the Order of Mary, that is basically my garage, the, the way that I established it was I took um, a multi-year training course from a group called the Alliance of Divine Love. And the Alliance of Divine Love exists to help people who have, even in modern times, uh, receive religious persecution for their, uh, for their practices. The, uh, the basics of becoming an Alliance of Divine Love minister, which I am also a mentor uh, in, this particular, in this particular group, so I can help you become a licensed ADL minister if that appeals to you. I think like 98% of the people who see this aren't going to need to take that step. There's going to be no reason to legally get the license to become a minister. I think that for most people, the, the deeper emotional and spiritual aspects of it can satisfy you for years. If you find yourself in a position where you need to marry someone, you're going to have, you're going to need some kind of training. Um, ADL training is, it's brief. It's, uh, um, it's powerful, but this is uh, in, in my, in my estimation, this experience that we're having here, this conversation that we're having here is the real, is the real heart of, of ministry. This is my attempt to get to the, the fundamentals of what it means to be a minister. And so if you go through all of this and you're like, oh, this is all wonderful. I love it. I want to, I want to become that minister that Reverend Paul talks about. I want to follow in his and other people's footsteps, perhaps. If you wanted to do that, um, I can help you out with that. But it's a, but that's like a separate process. It takes about 40 hours to go through this content. And um, there's a process of um, answering, a, uh, you just go answering a lot of questions. It's a lot of self-reflection and it's very particular to the Alliance of Divine Love. Now, the three books that you go through are Ever Closer, Even Closer, and then you get into the ministerial lessons. And ADL, the Alliance of Divine Love, was established by the two barbers. Uh, Barbara Selwar was the one who um, more or less um, what channeled, I guess is the one word you'd use for it, um, inspired. Uh, she was inspired to write these lessons uh, in the in the 1970s um, 
this is a, the entire, all of these stories were passed down to me in an oral tradition. They were just told to me by my teacher. I'm not even sure if they're written down. I'm, I bet they are somewhere, but that's not how I experienced them. So here's the story I received for how the Alliance of Divine Love was established. Um, the couple stories. First, the plane crash. Barbara Selwar was, I forget the conditions, but she was um, on a, gonna take a plane ride, a small plane. I don't remember where it was. But um, the night before she was gonna take this plane ride, uh, she had a visitation, essentially by an angel. That's how she describes it. And the angel came to her and said, you know, are you willing to be of service, like greater service to humanity? Are you willing to give your life you know, to do this? And I think she had been thinking about these kinds of things and she had sort of had some, some stirrings in her heart about this and she answered, yes, yes, I am. I'm willing to do this. The next day, as the story goes, she's on this plane with, um, I think it was like seven or nine people or something. And um, the small plane crashed and everyone died except her. And uh, she, when she relates the story, she really feels like it was a door, that like life had opened a door for her and it said, hey, do you want to stick around and do some stuff? Because, and if she, she the way she, uh, it was related to me, if she had been like, no, I, I, I'm good, I don't, I don't want to, no, no need to do anything else, she could have exited life that next day on that plane, during that plane crash. She just, that's how it could have gone down. But what she chose was to be of service. And so that plane crash really opened for her and concretized the importance of what she was being called to do. And so she writes this, she writes the books, and she begins to help ministers um, become ministers, which is the calling I had. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what I felt was the most important thing and was the most important expression of my personal spiritual practice was to help and encourage other people to find the connection and maintain it for themselves. And then when you need to become a minister, we can get into the Alliance of Divine Love. Now, what's really cool about ADL is it was it's established on this single principle, the principle of the greatest degree of love. And, and what I love about this is it's kind of like a unending Zen koan. It's a koan that you can open and unpack for forever. What you, it's, it's very simple. Here's the, here's the concept. In every event, in your own thinking, in your relationships, in any situation, how can you bring about a greater degree of love? How can you make more love possible for yourself, for other people, for society, for the planet, for the environment, for all of it? It, it is literally an unanswerable question and it keeps going. It's like, a, it's like a spiral that descends into the heart and you can ride that spiral into love forever. And it's incredibly practical from like a psychological perspective as well. Um, it's, it's a nice counseling tool. Uh, you know, it's like um, if you're wondering what to do in any situation, consider that the answer might be as simple as how do you make more love here? How do you generate more love and more resonance to the source of love or to love itself. And what's so powerful about love and using that word as a name for the divine love, divine love, is that everybody's experienced it. We are social creatures as humans and we are, we, we die without love, without a baby, without love does not thrive. It, it's immune system withers. It, it, it just so many things happen when we don't experience love. And Love is like this balm that can help heal trauma, it can heal pain, it can heal just so, it's like, a, it's like the key ingredient in a wonderful night that you have out with your friends or something. If there's love, if there's genuine love, you know, which could be expressed as camaraderie, it can be expressed as humor, it can be expressed as laughter, it can be expressed as a willingness to help, a willingness to pitch in. Um, it, I, I, I find it to be just the most profound little koan, the, the most profound truth, that no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you can always make more love there. And you can 
you can dedicate your being to increasing that degree of love. I think that's a great strategy at work uh, with customers, with uh, potential new business interests. Um, it's, it's great for entertainment. It's great for creativity. It's great for uh, producing uh, content. And, you know, it's like no matter what your thing is, no matter who you are, no matter what life has given you in terms of your toolkit, what tools life has put in there, you can always apply them with a greater degree of love. Also of interest, um, the Selwars, the two Barbaras that started ADL, they were in a ministerial program at Unity, at Unity Village. Um, Unity is a really interesting form of Christian mysticism that comes from the early, um, the early 1900s. And it was founded um, by this wonderful uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. Missouri mystics. They lived in Missouri, and this was like, oh, this was early 1900s. Um, I, haven't given, I haven't studied my dates recently on this, but there was a, the Theosophical Society was very powerful. Uh, it was kind of like a revival movement in England around this time. And uh, Ernest Holmes, um, who um, the science of, oh gosh, I'm going to be embarrassed later. The science of being, uh, he had the, he, Ernest Holmes, um, the science of mind and the uh, Christian, oh God, what's the name of that one? Christian science? Christian science comes out of his kind of thoughts. He, he, ba he basically had some inspired, um, you know, the Holy Spirit filled him, which I think is electricity and, you know, like the connection to life, it inspired him and he saw some truths and he described them as thoughts are real. So I don't know what it was like to live in like the 1850s, but apparently they didn't have that. It's really kind of funny to say it now to, to Westerners because that, that idea is everywhere, especially in spiritual circles. Um, the, the concept that if you've ever visualized something or you've ever been on a meditation where you were trying to have a feeling about something you wanted to manifest or create or whatever, all of this comes at least, at least part of it, one of its little spiritual roots comes from um, the, theos the Theosophical Society and these, these, these concepts of thoughts being real. So uh, Myrtle Fillmore attends kind of a, I guess, a rally, um, a revival, um, you know, uh, an inspired talk about these, about these ideas. And um, she comes away with this, with this concept that, um, that the thinking process is, is very powerful. Now, we know this for science now. We know that when, we, when you do scientific experiments with people and they, they visualize positive outcomes, they can improve their immune system. So in modern times, with modern scientific methods, we have proven that you can positively and negatively affect your immune system, which is your hormones, which is a huge cascade of chemicals in the body. Uh, you can affect so many of your inner states through what you think and how you feel. And you don't need some radical white paper to explain this to you. Just like go to Netflix or whatever, you know, whatever your video source is and just, you've got options, right? Do you want a feel good movie? If you watch the feel good movie, you're probably gonna get some oxytocin, which is the bonding chemical, the hormone of love essentially and all of these, you know, you can have like a, you'll come out of that movie and you'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, like you can, you'll have a you'll have a positive feeling you can also choose some scary horrible like serial killer ah, kind of movie and you're gonna just like and you're gonna come out of that with like some deep feelings about you know <laughs> about society and people and maybe maybe fear i mean you got like you could have some you could in inherit some real tear from something like that anyway whichever whichever choice you're gonna make you're going to have a biochemical level of that experience and it's the biochemistry, at least that partially, that affects that affects your body, that affects your health. So anyway, um, Myrtle Fillmore, she comes away with this 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 one concept, which was, I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit illness. Now she had some illness, I forget what it was, but it was a um, uh, I was a telephone prayer minister at the at Unity Village for a couple of years, and. Um, that the, the name of that telephone prayer ministry was called Silent Unity. And Silent Unity was the first telephone prayer ministry in the entire world. 
And uh, it was established in like 1913, I think, like br really early on with the telephone. Like there was a, a, a bundle of cables, which they call a trunk. And, and the trunk, there was a there was a bundle, a trunk that came in, bundle of cables for Kansas City. And there was one that came in for silent unity. So early on with the telephone, they grabbed that medium and they they would pray with people. And I was there um, in the early 2000s and uh, late 1990s. And um, that's what we would do. We would like silent unity. How may we pray with you? And the whole style of prayer was affirmative prayer. So if someone called up and said, hey, I want more money or I want a better job. You're the, the way that you prayed and you had kind of a, a manual that you had. It was kind of like a it was kind of like a record collection for a DJ, except it was all different kinds of prayers. So over time, you got good at kind of mixing the prayers together. And there was no prescribed way to pray. I mean, it was just the it was like just the same method that Myrtle Fillmore had come up with, essentially, in the early 1900s. And that was to just affirm what you wanted, like just affirm it. So if it was, if you were praying for someone and they were like, um, I want health, you could say, um, you know, I see the power and the light of God moving through you and toning and firming every organ in your being. I see um, perfect health for you and I see this health radiating through your being. Now, just in that, just in that one little description there, you can, if you can have all that biochemistry starts headed in the right direction. There's a whole scientific level to it, but there's also just like a simple direction that your that your mind and your heart is going in, and that was the whole point of the um, affirmative method of prayer. Is you, no matter what the topic, no matter what the idea, you are essentially um, affirming the positive outlook on that. And as a telephone prayer minister, you would you would get these calls and everything, and it was like a call center. You had quotas and all this kind of stuff, although it was pretty lightweight in terms of the the management and such. There was no, there were no dire consequences if you didn't pray enough. <laughs> but um, we would take down these prayers and we would pray for these people. It would call up from all over the world. And then all of those prayers would go into a chapel. And there was always 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There was always one of the prayer ministers in the chapel with those prayers, like affirming all of that stuff. We had a really antiquated computer system, which I think was from like the 70s. It was like, and this was in the 90s, um, that that would like send you a little letter. And so it was like an extra little thing where you would it would affirm the prayer and such. Um, Myrtle Fillmore. I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit illness. So she has an illness, I forget which one, and it was fatal. It was thought to be fatal at the time. And she, every like three hours or so, she would stop whatever she was doing. She was quite sick. And she's like, I'm a child of God, therefore I don't inherit illness. I'm a child of God, therefore I don't inherit illness. And she just did this and she was she healed herself. This This prayer process healed herself. Other people started asking her, hey, Myrtle, can you pray for me? And she would be like, of course. And she would pray for him. And when, when that word of mouth got very widespread, people would write her letters. And, they, and she would essentially affirm, use this affirmative method of prayer with people uh, wherever they were in the world. And it was the, the whole concept was we are joining you in prayer. We're, we're not like just doing the prayer work for you. We're, we're here to inspire you to pray. And uh, we, wanted, we want you to be praying and to be affirming your health and we'll affirm it with you. And when you called up the telephone prayer ministry, you know, that's what that, that's what that uh, set of DJ records was for. It was for, you know, lots of, lots of, lots of inspiration. And sometimes when people had like a real cool prayer, they'd write it down and they would, they, they would add, you know, add the record to the collection. So, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, Missouri mystics, Christian mystics, they said they established unity, silent unity, and they said this thing should only last 100 years. Now, institutions being what they are, they did not dismantle it at the 100-year anniversary like they asked, which I think is interesting because it kind of said, because the reason they wanted it dismantled is because they didn't want it to become a brick-and-mortar situation only. They wanted that inner thing to always be there. And um, my wife grew up in the Unity Church movement. Uh, 
um, I've spent years in different Unity churches and Unitics or people who go to Unity churches, they're usually pretty cool. I used to call it, I used to call Unity, uh, Jesus plus UFOs. <laughs> it was like, it was like, it was kind of like Jesus plus whatever else, whatever else you want. There was a, there, because Unity was, okay. It, it, it really tried, to, it really tried not to say no to anything. Unity tried to do that. It tried, it, Nah, I guess there's a discernment thing in there, but like what it really was trying to do, I think at its heart was to say, you find out for yourself what it is that works and then do that thing. And here's a bunch of people and you can share some of your ideas about what's working. You can start a meditation group or join a meditation group or there, and there's, if you go to a unity church, there's usually all kinds of very creative, um, kind of things that sit parallel to it. Um, I guess some people would call it new age or whatever, but it's, uh, it's, it's a hundred, it's more than a hundred years old. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty well established. Um, okay. Unity. Now back to the Barbaras. So the Barbaras were at Unity Village and they were becoming Unity ministers. And this is the 1970s and they wanted to use their intuition. Now, in using their intuition, they wanted to use tarot cards. Now, the tarot cards are extremely interesting because if you take a bunch of tarot cards and you hold them up, some people are like, oh, that's the devil's work. You know, it's like a, it's thought of as a negative thing by um, perhaps evangelical Christians, perhaps a more fundamentalist kind of Christian. Uh, a view of a strain of Christianity that says the Bible is the only thing and there can't be anything else in general. I mean, I know I'm simplifying it and I'm throwing like a huge number of humans in the world under the bus, which I do, don't want to do. But basically, yeah, they, there's it's sort of when you limit spiritual practice like that, I think you, I think you turn off the tap to the human spirit and the Barbaras wanted to do that. They, they wanted to use their tarot deck and they wanted to use their intuition as a, as a form of counseling and as a way of communicating to other people, like, um, to just help them. I mean, to, to just, to just do the work that they wanted to do. They wanted to do this. The Tarot. The Tarot comes from a period of history in Western culture where um, the Catholic Church was really getting down on people. I mean, there's the Inquisition. The Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition was like when, when the, the Spanish Church like basically went nuts and started murdering people. Like, hey, anytime your church is murdering people, pay attention. That's like you've probably got some politics involved in your religion. OK, that's why we don't persecute people for religious stuff in America. That's what's so great about America. And that's why we have such a powerful, diverse culture, because we give ourselves the freedom to practice. So sometimes, you know, when you join a spiritual group, they'll be like, you can do this, but you can't do this. You can do that. You can do every group I've ever joined has had some degree of that. Some of them much more intense than others. Right. And I think that the reason why spiritual groups do that, why teachers do that is they want you to focus. A teacher wants you to focus on what they're saying and they want you to zoom in and they want to create like a narrow but powerful uh, path to the divine. Ultimately, if that's I mean, that would be like the best case scenario. Right. You get to the divine, but you had to sacrifice perhaps some of your creativity and your spiritual uh, curiosity in order to do it. I think if you get to the divine, that is worth it in, in a certain way, right? So it's, it's worth it if it actually works. Um, there's also so many things about society and the way that people have to, you kind of have to find some common terms uh, with your neighbors if you're going to survive, if you live in a small agricultural community, like, um, 150 years ago or something like that, you probably had a pretty close aligned view with your neighbors in terms of the, the spiritual practice and such, especially in America. Uh, there's just a lot of need. We have a lot of need for social, uh, cohesion and we codify that we create rules about what you can say, what you can't say. You know, I cuss uh, as a, I like to cuss. It's fun. It's, it's fun, uh, but I also experienced years where I was in groups where I wasn't allowed to cuss at all. And I kind of scrubbed it out of my thing. So you can, out of my lexicon, you can, I, I don't believe, honestly, where I, from where I'm at now, I think I can understand why those things exist. I also don't think that they're the most important. I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything you can do that the real divine 
would have would would categorically say if you do that you're never going to get to me it's weird it's so it's so weird the way that it holds i mean just okay extreme example murder right killing someone it's like the it's like humans across time from all cultures describe it as one of the most intense things burdens that can be placed on a soul i was um I was born to uh, a father who had, had served stateside in the Vietnam War. I had an uncle who had served in Vietnam. Uh, and I had a stepfather who had served two tours in Vietnam in some of the most intense fighting in Vietnam. And I, so these three men who were my role models essentially when I was a child, they like, I saw the burden that taking life or even being close to life when it was taken had on the human spirit. And it is no joke. It is profoundly crazy. However, think about, um, think about uh, the ways that culture can kind of pull together and you can have an army like World War II, a more noble war, uh, a war that was fought against an evil, uh, that fascism, dude, they were like, fascism was the worst. It was like, it was like a clear evil. It was like, we're strong, we're gonna kill the kill the the weak and the old, and we're gonna repave this planet with our own ideals. People are like, no, we're, you're, we're no, no, you're not. And so that's a that's like you're really standing up to a a significant external what you see a bad force. Like no. So anyway, um, but just think about how many think about how much um, the allies. Um, created or killed or murdered or created death, but it's for this good purpose. So anyway, I just want to, I'm just trying to say um, in Hinduism, Ar Arjuna, uh, when he's talking to Krishna, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, I um, hope I'm getting these references right. I'm not as good at the Hinduism, but uh, they talk about like a soldier, you know, a soldier who's doing their duty and they're doing it for their homeland. That's a good thing. So <laughs> even the worst one, which is taking a life, you know, in the right context, can be good, you know, so it's a, it's a very, don't get too hung up on, on the rules is, I guess, my takeaway from all this. If, and, and if you can get away with not having to take any lives and you can get away, you know, just, you can get through reality without having to cause pain and you can perhaps create more love and connection. That's better. That's way better. And, you know, in my experience, that would be the preference of the divine, would be to do it without the suffering. And, and so much of that, um, so much of that conflict that, the, that, that we go through, it's human stuff. It's human, it's like the limitations of our languages, the limitations of our political systems, the limitations of our economic systems. It creates or, or emphasizes, or sometimes in a positive way, de-emphasizes de the, the conflict between people. Um, I feel like I'm getting a field for my original point, but basically, here's, here's an idea. Mysticism, direct experience of the divine. Why don't you just go ask? Why don't you just not take my word for it, not take anybody's word for it. Why don't you figure out how to go in and be with the divine for yourself and ask what you should do and figure out what you should do? Um, Alison Gray. Alec, uh, Alex Gray's wife, uh, the Alex and Alison Gray um, super team uh, that, that has that is creating Entheon. Entheon is a, a temple in Wappinger Falls, New York, that is a temple for finding the divine within. Okay, Alex Gray, an amazing, not only an amazing artist, but an artist that um, is a teacher. He teaches other, other souls how to be artists and their view at Entheon is that creativity, think about the creator, right? The creator and creativity is like a, a true expression of the divine. And you can, you can grok creatorness by creating. And I, I find that to be just, that's all, that is it. The, the human spirit and the human spirit's ability to, um, to rediscover these kinds of things, to rediscover that, 
that connection to the divine over and over and over and think about how the, the art man the the things that we create the the literary art but the 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 physical art the paintings and just the the songs the the poetry the the dark nights of the soul when people are writing about their struggles and then they break through and they they finally think they finally find the the real connection to the divine and then they live with it you know we have we have records of this happening over and over again through time Alex, uh, Alison Gray has this very simple uh, method that I heard her describe once. So I thought it was one of the best ways I'd ever heard it described, where she basically says, you know, you got to run. If, 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 you're, if you're talking to God, <laughs> you got to like run it through your ethical filter as well. You've got to like, if God says, do this, there is a, you, it doesn't just mean just go do that. Just like do it with like blind faith, especially if it doesn't agree with what you really know. Why is this important? Because there's a refinement process. The, the, first, <laughs> the first time I saw God, the first time I experienced that connection with everything, I wanted to tear off my clothes and run down the street naked shouting, it's all love. It's all it is. It's just love. It's just love. It's just love. I didn't do that. That was my inspiration. And I didn't actually do that. And I didn't do it because my best friend was there with me and he goes, he knew a little bit more about tripping on acid than I did. And he was like, hey, let's just hang on to that for a beat. And about 10 seconds later, 20 seconds later, I realized the wisdom of what he was saying. I was like, oh, okay, right. Like if I tear off my clothes and I run down the street, it's all love, it's all love. I'm gonna have to explain myself eventually, probably to some cops, you know? And I'm like, can I do that? I was like, are they gonna understand? And I was like, no, they're not gonna understand. And like they're not gonna get it the way that I that I saw it from inside. So anyway, you've you've gotta like <laughs> you're still a respond you should still be a member of society and figure out how to effectively communicate your divine inspirations. And you know, like get smart, like get project manager, get like get good at taking your um your inspirations and structuring them and then giving them out in a way that is harmless, that is positive, but it, that is powerful. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, you gotta, you, can't, you gotta do the work. You gotta do the work of, when you have that inspiration and you, you see that truth and you're like, I know what it is. You've gotta like, you, to communicate it to other humans, you gotta refine it. And usually that takes time. And that's why we call it mastery, you know, because you like you have to, to master something. You have to practice it over and over and over and over and over again. And we can we can do that. The human nervous system can learn lots of things. You know, I learned to speak. I learned to I learned to move. I, I learned to put all this stuff together for you. And um, I, I did that for a reason. I did that because I wanted to create a pathway to communicate this kind of stuff. Anyway, back to the barbers. Okay. Oh, dude, I, I feel a little sorry for my audience here because when I have people in front of me and I do this, I tend to be able to hold on to my threads a little bit better. And when it's just myself, I, I tend to go a little nuts. So thank you for hanging in here with me. I appreciate that. You're very patient. Um, the Tarot. Okay, so the Spanish church and the Inquisition. Man killed 7 million women and 2 million men in Europe who were the essentially the indigenous healers. They, um, I, I've read stories where, you know, the Inquisition would roll up into town and be like, oh, kind sir, I have a cut. Uh, where, can I, where can I receive help for this? And they'd be like, oh, you want to go talk to Mildred. She's our herbalist around here, like witch or whatever you want to call it, whatever the term was in their particular area. Anyway, that was the last time anyone saw Mildred because the Inquisition would roll up and she'd disappear. Like probably maybe be publicly executed or not. Or It's just horrible. What we did to ourselves in the West, we deleted our indigenous connection to the land and we lost a lot of knowledge. We've done it lots of times in the West, by the way. Uh, burning of the, Al of the Library of Alexandria, that's like a huge cut with the past. Um, there was a lot of ancient culture at... Uh, present before that that was recorded in that library and we burned it you know so i don't know 
you you cut with the past like that, you definitely lose a lot. But then, you know, you have like a, a fresh palette and you can like, I guess, raise your young people to think about things in a certain way without the interference from these other views and such. That interference, I, that is the individual spiritual process of each person unfolding. And I think that's universal. I think no matter where you go, if you just had like a time machine and you, ha you had like a I'm feeling lucky button, you know, like on the Google search, you could just press this thing and you could, um, you could hit that button and you could just go to any time and any place where, where, where there were people and it would just randomly select it. I think when you get there, <clears throat> you're going to find that people either have a connection to their local, rooted, deep spiritual practices. These are, I'm going to spend a lot of time describing this, but call it, uh, just for lack of a better term, call it an indigenous shamanism. Shamanism, uh, altering your state of consciousness for a, for a purpose usually related to need, usually related to a need uh, in, your, in your society. Um, so anyway, you got your time machine and you show up. People either have the connection, so they're already practicing it. If they don't have it, they can import it, meaning you can practice what another group of people have done, but that usually has all kinds of problems because usually the external, the externalized expressions aren't the real deal. There's usually something pretty internalized that, that is like the actual connection to consciousness, altered state of consciousness perhaps, inside of there. And then if you don't have that, if you, if you, do, if you don't have one, if you can't import one, I believe that you invent one and that cr human creativity, the human spirit will reinvent the connection to consciousness, to altered states of consciousness. It'll just do it. And, and the way it'll look, it'll look different. It'll be based on the resources. It'll be based on the culture of the time, the stories that they have, um, whatever their, whatever their history and their, their stories that they're practicing are, and they'll, they'll reinvent it. And I've got, um, I've got a lot of slides and a lot of things that we can go through to kind of, to kind of look at that, like how, how it actually works. Um, okay. So we've got the inquisition and that became what essentially indigenous knowledge in the West, in Europe became dangerous. It was not cool to practice something other than the official doctrine at the time. Death ensued for 9 million people. That's a lot of people considering the population. So the Tarot. The Tarot was an attempt to take some of the indigenous knowledge of Europe, the existing historical story-based knowledge of Europe, and put it into visual form and pictures and symbols and, and, and encode it in there so that it could survive things like the Inquisition, like the Inquisition. So it could, it could, it could, you could still have the knowledge, but if people are burning books, then uh, make it images. If people are burning images, make it stories. <laughs> you know, it's like you just try to, you just try to encode it in different ways. So anyway, the Tarot is could be considered a Western early version of psychology. And the, 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 the process of alchemy, the transmutation of coal or um, um, lead into gold, that is, that could be, I mean, that's perhaps like, you may, I've, I've heard stories from people who I believe them when they told me they've seen something like that happen. Like maybe I get into that later. It's kind of crazy, but, uh, there, um, it also be, could be a, an inner transfer, and, and you could see it as a psychological level. The transformation of the base coal, the base lead of our being into something golden and of light could be the equivalent of like someone becoming enlightened, enlightened, filled with light, right? So anyway, um, the tarot could be considered like an early psychological set of symbols and processes that we might like hundreds of years later call something like psychology. <laughs> like how do you take someone who has a lot of trouble and problems and how do you, how do you um, transform them? <laughs> you know, we, we, today, if you were, you know, part of a, a non-religious sort of group, you might say cognitive behavioral therapy. Like CBT uh, can like, and the processes of that can like help people get from one place to another. 
back in the day, they didn't have that. They didn't have science. And so they were like, listen, we've seen people transform and then we've got these symbols. Back to my barbers. So what they want to do, the barbers, um, they, Alliance of Divine Love, they want to like, they want to use the tarot as a symbol uh, set for intuitive counseling. And they're at Unity Village and for whatever reason, that wasn't cool. Like their, their teachers, their particular people they're working at, they were like, no, that's not, that's like too much. That's like of the devil, which is a very ununity thing to say. And you can't do that. So they basically kicked him out. So the Alliance of Divine Love was established to give religious protection under the First Amendment to people who want to practice things that other people in our culture might say are too crazy. So as long as there's not another form of, um, of licensing. So if like massage therapy, I'm a massage therapist. I was a certified massage therapist. You can become a licensed massage therapist. Um, you, because there's a state requirement for massage therapy, it, it's not going to fall under a religious clause. But like uh, today we're going to talk, we're going to talk about shamanism and we're going to talk about, uh, the practice of core shamanism and cross-cultural shamanism. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. And so if I'm practicing that, there's no licensing bureau I can go to. That's why you need your own 501c3. That's why you need your own chapel. The Alliance of Divine Love, um, the religious protection afforded under the Constitution of the United States does not apply to individuals. Little known fact. It applies to groups, churches. So you have to have an established 501c3, which is a, rel a religious institution. That's a tax code thing. It's, don't get me started about the taxes and the whatever, whatever. There's a, there's a calling that the human spirit experiences. But the way we handle this in America is you, if you're a member of a church, basically, you can practice what that church does and you're protected especially if you call yourself a reverend and you, you, um, you believe in what you're doing. You know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, conditions that you go through to sort of like legal tests if you were ever challenged. And of course, it's just common sense as well. If you're, if you're doing stuff that is basically helpful and people volunteer to do it and you want, like, you want to provide spiritual counseling, but you want to be protected legally to do it, you can become a minister and under ADL, and you can have that be one of the things that you do as part of your as part of your chapel. Um, in any event, what a long introduction to why you might want to be a, a legal minister. Um, however, you can practice a lot without having to go through a legal framework. Um, uh, yeah, you know. There's just no one's, if you walk out into the woods and you want to meditate and commune with God, no one's going to stop you. <laughs> and there's no, you're not breaking any laws. But if you want to perhaps counsel other people about that kind of stuff and you want to really cross your T's and dot your I's and like button it all up, um, you can receive some protections under that. Anyway, that's a longer conversation that I have with ministers who are actually going through the Alliance of Divine Love uh, training uh, with me. Uh, that process takes, I think I mentioned, it takes about 40 hours. And um, that's the only, at this point, that's the only thing I really charge for because the home church that I, Alliance of Divine Love that I work through, they charge and they have a structure and I want to uphold their structure. So that piece I actually charge for. But the rest of this stuff, this is the real deal. This is the real um, deep, rich, I'm giving you the goods here, guys. And uh, I want to see, I just want to see people be alive. I want to see them be whole and healthy and healed. And I want to see them connected to the divine and celebrating that in their lives. So I made this, the journey of the heart. The journey of the heart is a spiral, a spiral that goes in and in and in and in and in and in and it'll, you'll never get to the end of it because the goal is the source of it all inside you, what Jesus called the kingdom of God, um, the direct experience of love, um, I don't want to turn anyone off by my limited set of words that I use to describe it because words are silly when you describe what that is, because they're always a word is a, it's saying it's this and it's not this. And that experience of the divine, I have seen so many people, I have read so many accounts of people experiencing it and encountering it in, in so many different ways that it would be silly, I think, for anybody to sit from the outside and say, oh, that one's wrong and that one's right. It's silly. There are, there are pr probably more ways to the divine than we can count. 
the best spiritual guidance I've ever heard on this is like, um, love, love it. Whatever the divine is for you, love the divine. Seek the divine. It doesn't matter what form it is. It doesn't matter how you experience it, because that's going to probably be related to your own personal stories, your cultural stories, what's acceptable for you to practice and do, like with the people around you, what's legally available to you. I feel so sorry for like people who live in authoritarian governments like a China, that they just, it's illegal to talk about religion. It's like, dude, that's like saying that your nervous system is illegal. Because in my estimation, the nervous system of humans is designed to interface with the source of love. And so, I don't know, maybe you could come up with a completely Chinese friendly way of talking about it, but maybe, I'm not sure. I don't think, I think, I think that, that that's a political system trying to compete or, or be the spiritual system as well, or to delete the other spiritual systems. I think, I think that's completely horrible. And, um, and, and just untenable. Like you, I don't know, maybe, ugh. I'm glad I live in America. I'm glad I have the freedom to practice. And um, if I lived under a regime that told me that what I experienced inside was wrong, I'd probably be the first one against the wall. You know, I can't keep my mouth shut. They'd, hopefully I'd rebel against that stuff and not get stuck. Um, yeah, okay, so journey of the heart. Something every soul does and it's, a, it's an infinite path in to the divine that's inside of us. It's all of the features of your journey are going to look different. And yet, there is, there is a very powerful um, truth in being able to practice with other people. And uh, it's so cool to be able to talk about your own and then have someone else talk about theirs. And maybe the symbols and such of theirs aren't exactly yours, but like you can encourage other people to take their own journey to the divine. And to basically, it's just like being alive. It's like you're encouraging them to be alive and you're encouraging them to, um, to be full in their experience and to access their own creativity around their spirituality and to apply it. And uh, all of this is just window dressing on that primary uh, individualized relationship with the divine. So this talk, um, which I might never get through at the rate that I'm going, is uh, I've got three components to it. And this comes from many years of distilling these concepts and ideas down. In the middle here, we've got ministry. And ministry is, I think, a... Um, ah, we're going to need a definition. It's the bridging of that inner experience of the divine with the world. And I think... Uh, who was it um, who said, uh, Emerson? I think Emerson said, cast not your vote, but like cast your vote with your whole being. I forget the quote. Uh, yeah, you don't just cast your vote on paper. You cast your vote with your whole being. That's what I think ministry is. Your ministry is for people who are called to like cast their vote of life with their whole being. Uh, as a teacher, I was, I was a college professor for 10 years. I was ministering all the time in that. And I never brought up God. I never brought up, I sometimes would talk about some spiritual concepts and stuff because they were big for me. My students would bring it up, that kind of stuff all the time. But I would try to keep a nice separation of church and state, you know, people, federal funding for schools and this kind of stuff. I, I would try to keep it, keep it American legit, separation of church and state. But, um, I was ministering, I was, I, was, I, was, I was going to the divine to find the patience and the inspiration and the fortitude and the, the words and the, the symbols and everything I needed to express the concepts that I was expressing. And I was teaching technical, like technical trade school for IT and project management. Like I was, I was using the, my connection to the divine to teach something mathematical and scientific. And that worked great. Um, you know, um, I think parents, you know, are going to, they, they're going to relate to some of this. Um, I don't have any children myself. Uh, I've been a beta parent, a secondary parent for a lot of, a lot of humans in my life, which is a cool role. I like that role. Um, I just, there's, anyway, the ministry is a bridging, a radiating of the divine into your world. And that's not to say it's like, 
super simple. It's like you've got to get creative, man, and you've got to like really learn some, probably learn some basic project management. I uh, I have a process um, called becoming a deeply hoopy fruit, and this is a, a self-awarded towel for a deeply hoopy fruit, and. Um, that, that's a concept that comes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, there's this really wonderful uh, description of it, which I'll, I'll get into in a, in a little bit more depth. But this is my, this is my uh, intergalactic traveler towel. Um, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if you are a traveler and you travel to parts unknown, different parts of the galaxy, different planets and such, and you have your towel with you, uh, everyone's going to assume that, you are, uh, that you've got your stuff together that you're uh, a fruit or just a guy, a guy or gal, just a pretty cool person, and that you're hoopy. You're a deeply, a hoopy fruit is someone who's got it together. You can't go around being a flaky, I guess you can be, but um, if you want to be effective in the world, you're going to have to relate to the world on its own terms at some level. And so um, becoming a deeply hoopy fruit is a process of, of intrinsic project management, like how to, how to manage your personal energy, how to manage a group energy, and how to manage a project. Like, and I, I make it for ministers. This whole process is silly because I want people to um, learn the skills, but I also want them to be able to uh, apply it broadly to a lot of different things. So anyway, I've got this set of pins on here. I was telling you about Entheon. Um, this is my little Entheon pin. Uh, these are These are basically like self-awarded merit badges for like different kinds of things that I have done in my life, but they're intrinsic. Like, uh, like yours, your towel, your pins are going to be different. And ideally these are things that you built up from, from what you really wanted to do from your inner inspirations. So that's a, that, that I think is at least, a, at least a big part of being a minister is like, you know, knowing the legal requirements, knowing like the societal the society that you inter, that you exist in and how that's going to work out you know you're going to know as a member of a culture if you do something if that's going to be a problem or not if it's going to be illegal or not or whatever you have to follow the rules man at least in some cases until you don't i guess so uh, what i love about this picture is this lady she's like this with the divine uh, the, the, the sun and this is my symbol for the divine and it's like it's like she's bridging it it's like she's um, she's radiating it. Okay. Uh, in ministry, I think that one of the, one of the concepts that's important to lay out is this idea that it's, um, that you're a part of a group. You're part of a social network. When you minister, you essentially, um, bridge that experience of the hub of the social wheel. The hub that connects us all socially is love. It's uh, altruism. It's the, the golden rule. It's been expressed in many, many different cultures. And um, it, is the, it is the glue that makes society work. So ministry, when you're a minister of any kind, um, you, are, you are standing in for that, that experience for other people sometimes. Um, sometimes you're an officiant, meaning you're the official in charge of a process, like a ritual or a rite of passage. You might be a mentor in the, in the sense that it's your calling or responsibility to help someone move through a structured stage of development. Uh, rites of passage are cross-cultural. Um, all human cultures have them. Uh, they probably relate to the neurological uh, development of our, of our nervous system, but also of our brains in the sense that we're a child for a while. And then at a certain point, we have to become a young adult. And then at a certain point, we have to become a full adult. Sometimes we get married and we, we become part of a partnership and a union. Um, there's, uh, we go through stages of middle life and then elderhood. There's, there's rites of passage to kind of move into these different things. And of course, there's a rite of passage of death too. You know, the, the Catholic Church, they have the, um, they have the sacraments that like the, the seven sacraments that kind of, that are, that are like the rites of passage for the Catholic Church. But all cultures have them. I think that one of the one of the symptoms of modern society is we don't have good rites of passage, and that's where we get all kinds of problems. If you have humans that are supposed to receive a break in terms of they had one kind of development, and then the, their culture gathered around them, the people they cared about gathered around them, 
and they held the space and that person's like, you young man are no longer a boy. Today, you are a man in our tribe and you are going to, because you're a man in our tribe, you're going to be, you, there are certain things you can't do anymore. You're going to take on more responsibilities, but you're also going to take on more rights, rites of passage. And uh, you, if you go through a good rite of passage and your culture has a good system of holding rites of passage, then you get functional members in your society. If you don't do it right, you get this messy, like sometimes you see adults acting like kids and like, you know, uh, old people acting like children. And it's just like, ah, it's a freaking mess. And, and that's because you're, you're basically experiencing some kind of social breakdown. So a minister could be the person who, um, in, a, in a group, who understands the need for rites of passage. They could be the person that invites people to enter into a mentoring relationship with them to help them move through these kinds of things. They could hold rituals and processes that would uh, help people uh, move through that rite, sometimes called an initiation. Um, initiation is like, a, a, you know, there's so many different kinds, but like uh, an initiation would just be like, could be like an introduction to a new state of consciousness, a new set of responsibilities, a new set of abilities or powers. Um, in any event, the, I, this term ministry, we should make it very broad and, you know, the kind of the way I think about it is care of souls. A minister is caring. A soul could be like a, the, an eternal part of ourselves. Um, if we've got a material, um, call it like matter and energy, right? E equals MC squared energy and matter are the same thing, except that C squared, that speed of light squared at E equals MC squared means that there's a ton of energy inside of matter when you just do the math on that. But like energy and matter are the same thing is what E equals MC squared means. And, or at least they're translatable between each other, different forms of the same thing. And so we have a material part of ourselves, but then we have an energetic or an energy part of ourselves. And that's how it works around here. If you are matter of any kind, you are an atom. And on the outside of the atom, you've got electrons. And elect so right there, you've got you've got the protons and the neutrons at the core of an atom, you know, are kind of like the matter parts. And then you've got this electrical field, this this E, the 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 electron nature around it, and that is a part of everything. So like everything that is that you can touch and that you can smell and taste and you can see light bouncing off of or radiating from, that's that's this, that is a matter and energy, that is a material and electrical dance going on at a level that you can't even perceive with the senses we have. We have to do math and science deeply to get to those levels and have instruments and tools that can look at the heart of our reality in order to even get it because it's so fundamental. So anyway, soul. I'm just going to use, I'm just going to use that term. Um, a soul like in my experience, and this is not my theory, this is what I've seen with my own eyes and with my own intuitive understanding. But here's the point, it's, it's I've, I've seen it. Like if, if what I say inspires you to like look for it yourself, that's good. Because um, you don't have to take what I'm saying as like written law, it's just my own experience. So I am, I am sharing with you my experience. So I have seen souls, um, you know, come, like basically seek an incarnation and like a mom, a parent, a mom and a dad or a mom, like, like seek a soul. Like they, like when you get pregnant or basically you're having sex, you're like um, starting the conception process, right? That is an energetic event that like a soul can mer basically come in. So where souls come from, we'll leave that as a mystery for a second, right? Uh, they, 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 they need to like find a placement. Okay. The, the, the house, the body of the woman, um, the, the emotional state, that all could be prepared for a soul to come into. You know, a, a, a house that's ready to have a child um, is very different from someone who just, um, you know, doesn't plan it. And, uh, and man, if you're a soul and you're, you want a certain kind of nurturing kind of experience, you're going to look for like a good place where you're going to look for a, a, a nice landing pad, essentially. So, okay, so you've got soul and it's coming in and then it's getting born. You, there is, I have seen that there is a, a set of blessings that can, that can happen for mom and baby 
as the soul is kind of um, gestating with mom. And there's, I've also noted that there is a certain kind of blessings you can't do when mom and baby are so close. It's basically, you can't give, like in, in my experience, you can't really give so smoothly uh, blessings to the baby when, when it's with mom, because birth is gonna be this insane rite of passage. And when you, when you, have, when you are born, that's the, that's the first separation of mom and baby. After the birth, mom and baby are very close anyway, like emotionally, and um, they're just, they're, they're kind of the same being for a while. But there's this kind of separation and individuation that happens. Then you have like a then you have a soul that's in a body. There is a kind of blessing that can happen for a young a young child that is essentially like a clearing of the of the body and uh, of the physics, the the DNA, the body they've inherited, and uh, it kind of prepares it kind of prepares the vessel for more of the depth of the soul. So anyway, you can think of this as like blessings before there's even sparks. You can think of it as ble uh, some kind of a blessing process when um, mom and baby are in the same body, when mom and baby are close by. And then when the child is on their own, there's like a, uh, there could be like a christening. That's my term. I, that's like, the, I love christening, like a, a preparing of the Christ path for that soul. And when I say Christ path, I mean universal path, the universal path to the divine. Uh, the, I believe that Jesus Christ was expressing a universal path that was open to all people. And he did quite a bit to try to express that universal nature of it by the choices he made and disciples and all kinds of stuff that was, that was, that was kind of emphasizing that universal nature and uh, that it was open to all people. So, christening. And then you've got, um, you know, there's all those rites of passage. Those are opportunities for blessing and like infusion of consciousness and learning into the, into those souls. Then you've got, um, marriage potentially, or, uh, if you were going to be a celibate in this life and just dedicate yourself to God, then there's a, there's an initiation there too. But let's just say you're getting married. That's like a whole new thing. And then, um, you know, uh, of course, then, you know, a minister would facilitate a marriage. Um, if there is a, a separation from a partner, that's a whole nother thing where you have to help with that, help that spirit uh, that's leaving the body, the person who's dying. You have to help them uh, gracefully exit the body, but everybody dies. So let's just say it's everybody at the end. There's a way of kind of gathering up the experience from a life and mm, concentrating it a bit and making sure there's a smooth transition from body to not body. And then there's a transition back to uh, like a big cycle of where this whole thing comes from, like like a giant circle of life, you know? And that's like in Buddhism, that's like the, the, the wheel of Dharma. You know, the Hindus call it, it's like an incarnational cycle um, as you're going through. In any event, a minister is, <laughs> sorry, a minister is the person who, the being who helps a soul with all of that. So you could think of it as kind of like a midwife for all these different transitions. And you could think of <coughs> a rich and functional culture as having good ministers. And if you're lucky, you live in a place with happy, holy, healthy, ecstatic, balanced ministers who don't charge you a lot for these fees, I suppose, or charging for the fees is a different kind of thing, but like a different question. But like, to me, that's what, that's the, that's the celebration. I hold that as these, these spiritual things that happen to a soul while they're here, they need help. We all need help. We need initiation out from outside of ourselves. We need some kind of reflection, uh, about these kinds of things, the, the, the things of our hearts, the things that, um, the, the things that we, we aspire to be. That's why we have mentors. That's why we have, you know, um, people who are like parents, but not parents in our lives to reflect these things back to us. All of this experience of life gets richer when the ministers really know about the source of it all and can use their intuitive intuition to mediate these experiences 
properly for the soul, for the culture, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's like a, it, it, the way that I do it here in Evergreen, Colorado, in my Western culture, is gonna be different than they're gonna do it in an Islamic culture in the Middle East, but it still needs to be done. That's what's so cool about the universal nature of soul, is that it's, it has to be done, and it has to be done well. So this, this whole thing here, Journey of the Heart, it's, I, I'm trying to make it as universal as possible. I'm trying to broaden the experience as much as possible. And you can see how, even if you weren't a formal minister with your own ch chapel or whatever, you still have, you still are going to be called to, to do these kinds of functions at different times in your life. So I, I think that the study of the study of ministry could be a general science. You know, it's just like a, it's like a study of how you connect with the the infinite, the divine, or inspiration, love, whatever word you use for it. Um, how you connect with it, and then how you share it, and how you share it with others, and how you hold that um, in a way that your relate your your personal relationship with the divine is likes. <laughs> I don't know. That's a I'm right at the end of my metaphors, but like I know that I'm doing ministry right because I have a primary personal relationship with that source. And so I run all of my questions by it. I, I, I ask, I ask, and I ask for help, and I ask for inspiration, and I ask for like, what's right, what's wrong here? Is this the right thing to say? Is this not the right thing to say, you know? And I'm a work in progress, man. I'm not perfect, I'm not a perfect listener. I mean, if I was a perfect listener, I don't know what it, I'm just not. So I, I can, uh, and I have my own foibles and my own growing edges and everything else. And I'm just a person. I'm just a regular person. But so it's like, it's always going to come through a, a Paul filter and it's going to come through P Paul's cultural filter and a whole bunch of other stuff. So anyway, but it's a, it's a, it's a core art. It's like soul care, soul maintenance and help. That's our ministry. Okay. Um, Journeying over here on the left. Journeying is a, I call this thing the journey cycle. Journeying is just a word that describes a procession of altered states of consciousness that are structured um, because they're structured in, in this way because that's probably how the human nervous system learns, especially in altered states of consciousness. It comes from that, that particular graphic there I created, and it comes from an amalgamation of 20 plus years of practicing, um, being a shamanic practitioner, and I'll unpack all that, but core shamanism was brought to us from, or kind of rediscovered, I guess, in the West by Michael Harner in the late 70s, uh, based on his own initiatory experiences um, with the Shuar, who were in uh, Eastern Ecuador. And... Uh, he basically was in another culture and experienced some very powerful spiritual rites of passage from an indigenous group of people, you know, in their hands. And that inspired him to, to go on his journey. And his, out of his journey came this thing called core shamanism, which is like cross-cultural practice of altered states of consciousness. And I've got a lot of things to say about that. Um, but... The reason why this is one of the three core things that I have here is because, oh, and the reason why it's in this circle is because I, uh, I cribbed some stuff from Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung about the hero's journey. And I kind of, I kind of blended 20 plus years of practice, plus a little core shamanism, plus some Joseph Campbell, plus um, my own, uh, I think I already said my own experience, but I, I kind of blended it all together. And I created this framework that allows you to get better at, exploring altered states of consciousness in a structured way. And that's called, um, that's called uh, shamanic practice. And it's cross-cultural, uh, not in my book, cultural appropriation, because I believe that the techniques involved in it are at the root of the human nervous system. That, and I'll, we'll go into this in depth, but over time in every culture, we tend to rediscover these core techniques and we tend to express them. And uh, so I think that the only way you can explain that lots of people in lots of cultures uh, kind of have the same general approaches 
at their roots. Not the, not the cultural trappings, not the stories, not the costumes they have, because that's going to be the materials they have in their environment. But like the core roots of it, it looks to me and a lot of people like the, ner the human nervous system works in a certain way and we all rediscover these techniques. So we'll get into that and uh, we'll get into like what it is and how it works. I, I think that journeying um, and uh, becoming a shamanic practitioner is a core way of creating this ministry bridge uh, between the source and the culture. And it's a, for me, it's an absolutely critical piece. I could, I could not be here talking to you like this if I had not studied that and practiced that for years. And um, it's, it's basically a, a mysticism key. With journeying, you can unlock a door inside yourself and you can enter in, walk through that door and you can experience other dimensions directly for yourself. It, until you've seen it for yourself, it's just a story. It's easy to pass over, but they're real. You can experience spiritual nature. Uh, so God, uh, whatever you call the great one, the great light or whatever. Um, but you can also experience um, ah, deceased relatives, um, you know, the spirits of nature, the spirits of a place. Uh, there's just, I know it sounds... It sounds cheesy without a full explanation, but it, they're real and they're important. And I think that given enough time and given a science that is really science, meaning it really is interested in exploring what's actually going on in our, in our world, science will eventually catch up and maybe in a thousand years or whatever, we're going to, or a couple dozen very enlightened years, we could have a view of the world that includes what traditional cultures, but our own culture has, has understood as the other states of consciousness that are around our waking consciousness. And uh, anyway, so that's, a, that's the bulk of it is that one. And then um, we have this, we have heart math. I started practicing heart math in the late 90s. Um, I used it in a rites of passage program uh, called Earth School, which is where I uh, met my wife. Um, she ran this program and was looking for a uh, a man to do the the boys' side of the program to be like basically a mentor to these uh, young these young men. And I joined that and I I helped with that and uh, for years until it dissolved after the after nine eleven. A lot of the funding for five hundred one c threes dried up in the United States, and um, but it was um, heart math. Heart math is rails for this process. Heart math keeps us honest in a certain way. Heart math comes from uh, Southern California, from Boulder Creek, Colorado, or Boulder Creek, California. Uh, it's in the, it's nestled in the Redwoods, the Heart Math Institute. And it is, a, um, it is some science. It is some powerful science around the heart, the heart-brain connection, around uh, coherence. And all of these, these little, these little uh, breathing, um, they're basically five second counters. This five second breathing um, pattern is a way to integrate energy. It's a way to access from a very practical perspective, the, the, the wisdom that's coming out of the heart. I mean that like literally and metaphorically it's a, it's more than 20 years of good science and um, is a, uh, basically when you practice heart math, you practice this coherence in your heart that opens your vagus nerve, which is like, kind of like the feeling of your heart opening and being heart centered in your life, heart based, which is a, a universal experience. Like if I'm in coherence, I could probably walk into any culture in the world and be in my heart and, and be a little better at um, interacting with people, even if I didn't know anything about their culture. I'd probably make fewer mistakes culturally, and I'd probably have a better experience um, not only receiving uh, what another group of people would be telling me and asking me to do or whatever, but also I'd probably have an easier time expressing it. It is, uh, it is profound, and we'll, we'll get into it. But what's so cool is um, heart math uh, is the perfect way to center in on the source of love. 
I, they are a, uh, they're a very sweet group of people. Uh, they have the HeartMath Institute, which does all the science, and then they have the HeartMath training kind of component, which teaches the world about what the science is and tries to come up with good teaching metaphors for how to express it and explain it. It's a core thing. I've been doing it for more than 20 years. It's core. It, everybody can learn it, but especially ministers. What's so powerful is that it, it takes you into your heart. It takes you to that holy place at the center of your being. I call it, um, they would not say this because they're scientists and they have, they have, they're very disciplined about not including spiritual or religious language. Essentially they want it because they don't want it to be written off. They want people to take it seriously cross-culturally uh, because it's so important. And I, I, I respect and want that for them and for the world. You can practice art math and never have to relate it to ministry or um, shamanic journeying or anything like that. I This is my own homebrew. And um, I became a heart math uh, trainer and a mentor and a coach. And uh, I'm experimenting with a little side business where I actually uh, help people in businesses or in churches. I'd love to come into a church and teach everybody how to do heart math as a way to kind of make a community or help make a community, help a community be more cohesive and coherent. That'd be super fun. Anyway, I'm playing with that on the side. Uh, but what I'm going to, I'm going to express in this one is uh, their most powerful technique, which is their simplest technique, and the first technique that they came up with. And um, uh, it's not, I am a trainer and a mentor and a coach, but this is kind of an off-label use of the whole thing. It's a very spiritualized application of it, which is not something that they officially uh, do. Uh, but I think it fits really well. Okay, so this is kind of an in-depth look at the journey cycle. And... Um, Oh, it's just too much. I can't explain it right now. I got, I got to move on to the next thing because that's where the, that's where the energy is. So let's do a little heart math together. Um, this uh, information that I'm going to give you comes from this book, The Science of the Heart. Now, what's so cool about this book is that um, it's available online. So the HeartMath Institute essentially publishes this book and all of the concepts, many of the graphics come from this man's work. This is um, Dr. Roland, uh, Roland McCready. Doctor? Doctor, yeah. At least a PhD. And anyway, he's a wonderfully eccentric uh, scientist uh, that lives in Boulder Creek, uh, California. He's a really cool guy. And um, he's the main scientist that has um, kind of, un kind of, he wrote this book. And he is the, he's the person who has, has been, resp if you've heard of heart rate variability, it's because of him. If you've heard of um, coherence in the heart or the heart brain connection, it is probably because of him he, and his, his teacher, uh, I forget his name. Um, he coined the term executive function, which is like, you know, the big term for like mental functioning and like professional performance, uh, coherence in the heart increases executive function. Anyway, a very, a, a lifelong study of the, um, of the science behind how things like intuition actually work. Um, how, um, how, we have non-local awareness of events. Um, one of the stories he tells, and I've heard him describe it in different documentaries, is you can take two people and you have them practicing heart-based coherence with each other for just like a few minutes. And then, so essentially they're in sync. So these two people are in sync with each other. Then, how does this work? Oh, okay, I'll give it, uh, okay, never mind. This will just be with, that's a different story. Uh, I'll change it, a little different. Okay, so forget the coherence part. <laughs> what you do, there's this experiment that they do, which is very cool, which kind of illustrates some of the um, out of the ordinary nature of the heart and its wisdom and its power, okay, uh, scientifically. So what you do is you take a person, you put them in a, a little room and they have a computer in front of them. Um, when they're ready, I'm gonna get the details wrong, not a scientist, just a science explainer. <laughs> you, when they're ready, they press a button and then there's like, I believe there's like a little countdown. It says it's going to, it gives them, it gives them like a little, a little countdown that basically is like a 10 second count to when it's going to show them an image. They're also hooked up to like an EEG. So they have a, they, they've got a very good uh, electromagnetic window into the inner functioning of the person. So they're, they're wired up and you can see the heart rate and you can see the, the variability in the heart rate, but you can also see like just the whole inner kind of state. The, um, when they press the button and they're ready, the, it, there's sort of like this 10 second countdown, right? 
And then just like uh, right before, like I forget, but it's like two seconds before the image is shown, the computer randomly uh, does a random number generation, randomly chooses a number, the number is associated with a picture, probably in the programming, and then the picture comes up. Now the picture can be two styles. One, just peaceful. Just a sunset, bunnies, uh, you know, something calm, something easy, a warm a candlelight, something like that. Or it could be like a snake or uh, a picture of a surgery in process. Just something that yeah, creates like a physiological reaction in the body. That, <laughs> what's so cool about the experiment is that the heart knows what the image is going to be before the computer actually picks it. So you can see a change. If, if the image is of a snake jumping at you, you can, that, you, you can go back into the data and you can, the, the, the heart will start to give that signal before the computer even chooses it. So what it's, what it's kind of saying is that your body, your body, your heart, which is this primary system, this primary energetic um, function within your, within your whole being, your electromagnetic being, it has foreknowledge of what's going to happen even before we can even, we, we can't even really explain like, because the random number generator is random. It, it could be a snake. It could be a bunny. So like, how does your heart know? And that's kind of, that's kind of the, 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 the teasing out of the science that we, that we have this just intuitive pre-knowledge just of a few seconds. But in some cases, um, Roland has done studies with uh, uh, law enforcement officers and with um, soldiers. And they, you know, apparently um, there is a feeling that law enforcement or will, will have before they go into a house or a soldier will have before they break down a door. And I guess a lot of soldiers and police officers will tell you this. They'll basically say, listen, there's like this feeling I have. And when I listen to that feeling, I step to the side and then, you know, the shotgun blast came through the door and I would have died if I hadn't done that. So it's like this, um, it's like a system within us, or at least an aspect of a system within us that is able to keep us safe when there, when, we, when there really shouldn't be a reason. There's no logical, our current science is limited in its ability to explain uh, what that is. So that's just, that is just one, uh, one little example of that. So anyway, science of the heart, let's get into it. This heart-brain coherence has a lot of very positive uh, results in a state of personal and social coordination <coughs> and optimization, where focused is improved by 24%, sleep is improved by 30%, calmness by 38%, anxiety is decreased, which is a positive thing, uh, decreased by 46%, fatigue goes down 48 and depression goes down 56%. These are based on, um, I think it was more than a, I think it was more than a hundred thousand people uh, taking these like these like uh, personal assessments. So they take the assessment, they practice heart math for say two weeks, and then they um, and then they take it again. And these are this is self-reporting. So it, this is a very powerful tech. And the reason why um, heart math for ministry is because of these kinds of things. Imagine if you could go into a funeral as a minister, an extreme example, and you could maintain your equanimity, you could maintain your balance, and you could be just, you know, in alignment and um, essentially radiating this coherence to other people so that when people saw you as the minister, they would get calm, they would get simpler, they would get more, they would basically start to experience some of this kind of movement. So it's, uh, it's extremely powerful. It comes from what um, Roland has discovered as the heart-brain system. The long, the long and the short of it is, is that the heart and the brain are one system. But they don't have to be in alignment. So uh, if they're out of alignment, signals from the heart either coordinate activity in the brain or they introduce disharmony into the functioning of the brain. So depending on how your heart is, your brain is going to work better because it's the same system. You can see on this graphic on the left here that you've got some when your when your heart signal is very uh, when the elect we'll talk about what all the different forms of it when the electromagnetism essentially of the heart um, and the rate of the heart is in chaos 
then the brain does not function as well. Um, the brain, uh, when people report being stressed out, in anxiety, in distress, you can put on a heart rate monitor, and this is the this is a, the simplest form of it. Um, you can get very complicated with this. This is the, called the Inner Balance from HeartMath, and it is a um, it's just a little thing you can get on Amazon. It is very simple. It uses a uh, it uses a little transmitter here, and it's got a little um, infrared light essentially that it shines uh, through the tissue in your ear, and this allows you to detect what's called the pulse wave, basically the pulsing of blood in the in the body. Now, when you detect the pulsing of that blood, you can that it's not an electromagnetic sensor, as far as I understand. Um, it, it's not it's not detecting the electromagnetism. It's just detecting that pulse. But from that pulse, you can kind of back into the uh, the electrical signal, and and the electrical signal is what we traditionally think of when we think of like the heart rate. So a couple more bits here. The heart sends more information to the brain than the reverse. So when we're talking about the heart brain system, what we're talking about is a, it, the thing down here. The heart is sending way more info to the brain than the other way. So you could I like to think of this as. Um, the, the heart is creating like a wave that the brain is surfing on. It's like the heart makes an ocean wave and the brain surfs on it. If you get a good wave, you can really ride that wave and get some stuff done in this life, you know? Get some productivity. Rock it. But if, you're, if it's a choppy, like imagine that the heart is sending rough waves or not smooth, you can't ride on those. You might not even want to be out there in that surf. You know, you certainly can't do much with it. That's a, I think that's a good... A good metaphor. Um, the heart employs a network of neurons to coordinate its activity just as the brain does. So the the same way that we think of our, our so our brains, these little cells called neurons, um, there's so many of them in the brain and every neuron has just so many connections and every one of those connections has so many little synapses and every one of those little synapses has so many little molecular switches. It's just, it's, it's amazing. There's like, um, uh, there's just, there's more connections in your brain than there are stars in, in the, our galaxy. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's just, it's beautiful. So this complicated thing I'm doing here where I'm coordinating movement and thought and language, that coordination is possible because of networks of neurons, basically pathways of electricity firing in my brain. Long story short, the heart does something similar. Um, so you could think of the heart as having memory, independent of the brain. Um, you could also think of the heart as having logic in the same way that our neural systems um, record patterns, and we call those patterns learning. The heart does the same. So when you're talking about like, now let's go metaphor, right? So you're talking about like, using the wisdom of your heart or living from your heart or using your deep heart wisdom. You're talking about, you, you could be talking about neural networks in the heart itself that are informed and passed down to you through your genetics, from your ancestors, through epigenetics and through other mechanisms. Um, anyway, there's just a lot, there's just a lot there. There's a, it's a, it's a beautiful system. And a lot of Roland's work is helping us as a species like unpack um, what's going on. You know, I just want to, I just want to back up here for a second. When I first met Roland, I asked him just a ton of questions because I've been, I had so, so many questions built up and he told me a story about um, spirulina and essentially he was one of the first people, if not the first person um, in a small group or maybe just him, I can't remember the story, the details, but like he, the spirulina, like the green, if you, if you go get a green drink at any health food store and you look on the back of the label, there's going to be spirulina in there. Apparently, um, uh, Roland identified spirulina, figured out how to, um, create the vats and the right temperature and oxygen and water alkalinity conditions necessary to grow spirulina in bulk and essentially started that health craze, that health fad, um, in the, uh, I think it was the eighties or the nineties. Um, anyway, he's, I've never heard him, cre I've never heard him credited with that, but he, he basically started that industry. And you think about just, it's just spirulina is in everything now, you know, it's just like, it's just like a part of foods. It's a whole, it's a whole category, green foods, you know, and he started this thing. So anyway, I think Roland's a freaking genius. 
I think he's like, he's got like this really powerful combination of like creativity and then like a humanitarian drive to kind of help the world. So uh, next time you drink a green drink, think of uh, Roland McCready. <laughs> anyway, okay, so back to our heart brain system. So when we're, when we're talking about how this communication actually happens, the, um, uh, there's a couple of different things. So you've got your nervous system. That's the neurological pathways of the heart brain connection. That would be um, the same system that I'm using to like move my fingers because my brain says move fingers. But what's happening is that what, what, what at least partially what's happening is the heart boom, 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 produces the wave that electricity passes up the vagus nerve into the brain. You get all of that, just like a computer takes raw electricity from the wall and then channels it into all these different distinct pathways. That's what the brain's doing with the heart's energy. Channels it into pathways, you know, and then I, and then sends the signal down my nervous system for me to move and wiggle my fingers down there. So that, that those electrical pathways, and we can put little, um, electrical probes in the body and we can put them in individual neurons in the brain and we can see that electricity kind of moving. So that's one of these methods of communication. We also have the biophysical, which is the pulse wave. That's what was being detected there uh, with my little sensor there in the ear. Um, we can get into this in a little bit, but this is a, uh, this system here, the, the inner balance, it's a, it's a very simple little tool. You can bring it up on your phone and you can actually see the coherence of your heart. And it's a, it's a wonderful feedback system that you can use to train yourself to, to stay in heart coherence. By the way, I think I skipped that before. Um, uh, Chinese medicine. Um, when uh, you're trained in Chinese medicine, there are pulse points uh, on the, all, over the, all over the body. And a good Chinese doctor can basically feel the pressure, the... Um, the force, the uh, perhaps the frequency of the pulsing, and they can diagnose quite accurately um, problems in the body by by just feeling pulses moving through the body. So anyway, you got this pulse wave. The pulse wave could be like like the the blood moving, but there's probably more to it. You also have biochemical. That's the hormone uh, cycle in the body. Uh, a cascade of 1,400 plus chemicals and all the ways that they work. The, the hormonal system is a, a long wave. Um, it's, like, it, it's like a recording system. So if you, get, if you have uh, like a scare, like a, a shock in the system and your body produces adrenaline, that's a hormone, right? So the adrenaline kicks in. Say you're in your car and you, uh, you almost get in a wreck. Uh, you know, it's like your, your body produces that adrenaline in order to have you react and stay alive as, a, as an organism. Okay, that hormonal reaction doesn't go away like real fast. That you know that if you, it, or if you, that, that shock is going to stay with you for some time. One of the cool promises of practicing coherence is that when you have a shock like that to your system, an unplanned experience that has a hormonal effect on you, you can practice heart coherence to shift the way to shift the hormones in your body. Essentially, the, the concept here is that the heart produces, um, it's, it's recently, Roland was telling me this, it's recently been reclassified as a gland. So in the way that your pineal gland might produce dimethyltryptamine, which is the um, end of life chemical and the chemical that gets produced when you're um, like uh, dreaming, essentially. Um, and your, uh, your, your adrenal glands produce adrenaline and your, um, your testes or your ovaries produce estrogen or testosterone in different balances. Um, you, you have all these glands in your body that produce hormones. It's where, they, it's where they get produced and then they get circulated. Your heart produces a whole set of them including oxytocin, which is the bonding chemical. Um, and there's just, a, there's just a lot more that comes out of there. So anyway, your, um, the communication between the heart and the brain is also mediated through the whole uh, endocrine and nervous system. Um, I wanna show you something here, although it's very unheart mathy to kind of blend these things together. But I just wanna drop it in. 
Um, later, we're going to talk about the uh, subtle energy system. And so this is not heart math stuff, but this is the book that I'm going to recommend that you use to explore your subtle energy system. Kundalini Awakening, A Gentle Guide to Chakra Activation and Spiritual Growth, written by uh, John Selby. A uh, pretty interesting guy. Pretty wonderful guy. Um, the... Uh, this is kind of a Westerner's guide to the um, Eastern energetic system. And so here in this little graphic, you can see kind of the colors and the different hormonal systems of the body um, described. Uh, this is like kind of one way of looking at it. So yes, it's chakras and it's, uh, uh, what, what I love about it is it's experiential. So um, this book is a, a wonderful tool that I've been using since I was a teenager to connect with the hormones and the glands that produce the hormones and all of the subtle levels of that experience. And, um, you know, uh, I've, I've heard lots of people poo-poo on, you know, chakras and this kind of stuff. I, you can poo-poo on it right up until the point when you experience it. <laughs> because once you start experiencing it, and this is a great, great guide for how to do it. Um, when you start experiencing it, you... Um, uh, there's, the, you have to come up with a new, you have to come up with some new pattern. It can't just, it's, it's the kind of thing where if someone's like, oh, chakras are goofball or silly. I'm like, how long have you thought about it? And how, how long have you tried to access that? And most of the time the answer is not very much at all. And it's like the, the chakra system, this was, um, you know, and that the subtle body energy system, you know, as it's described um, in Hinduism, comes from the forest rishis. Uh, the forest rishis were essentially saints, uh, holy men and women who went out into nature and they listened to the sounds of their own being, their own, um, their own chakra system, their own gland system, essentially. They had, they had conscious experiences of something that could be considered a body uh, level event. And uh, they wrote all this stuff down. And so the Vedas, the, the holy books of India, which might be some of the oldest texts on the planet, they come from nature. That's why Hindus don't feel a strong compulsion to convert anyone, because they, I've been told, they basically see it as nature. They see na people as part of nature and their, their spiritual wisdom um, as just an expression of nature and a, and a way of creatively kind of writing that all down um, it, it, for the purpose of contact with the divine. That's yoga means union with the divine. So anyway, it's a concept that we throw around a lot in the West. And um, anyway, I just break it all down there. Anyway, I'm, I'm trashing my, my, my pure expression of, of heart math here a little bit. Anyway, let's kick back in. You also have energetic. Um, energetic is electrical and magnetism. So um, the way that um, the electromagnetic spectrum works is whenever you have an electrical current, it creates a magnetic field. And whenever you have a magnetic field, it creates an electrical current. So electricity and magnetism are basically the warp and the weave of a field that connects everything together. I think that that is the, um, again, diverging from the heart math, I won't apologize anymore. Just, um, this is not an official, this is not an official heart math transmission. This is, uh, this is me kind of spitballing on a number of different subjects. So, um, if you go to uh, India and you talk about energy or consciousness flowing up the spine, they call it Kundalini. If you go to China, they might call it Qigong. If you go to Japan, they call it Siki. And they call the practice of it Siki Jitsu, the manipulation and the healing of the body through the reestablishing of the natural energy system, uh, natural energy system of the body. Um, if you go to the Kalahari Bushmen of uh, South Africa, just above, or just above South Africa in the, in the deserts there, um, they call it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to click your tongue when you say the N. Mm -hmm. That's their name for it. Um, there's a, every culture has a name for it. And in the West, we call it the Holy Spirit. And I think um, the Holy Spirit is a, is a way of talking about electricity. Electricity is the way that we, we've talked about it since the 18, late 1800s when we discovered the electron. And when we harness electricity, we created the first Tesla, Nikola Tesla, um, in uh, Telluride, Colorado, created 
the first application of, of electricity. He created the first electrical engine from harnessing these concepts and these ideas. By the way, Tesla was very much inspired from a very shamanic kind of altered state. He, if you read any, he's got a lot of crazy writing, but he talks about visitations from angels and all kinds of stuff. Just think about that. The guy who was talking to angels and thinking about all these wild, crazy ideas is the one that gave us electricity. You know, electricity, the thing that's like running everything in this room, the, the thing that's the mediation of electricity itself is why you can receive this message, um, you know, in space, a distant message in space and time. Okay. Um, electricity, Holy Spirit, the, uh, that is the, the heart, boom, 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 when it's beating, is producing an electrical and a magnetic field. And that energy is transmitted through the nervous system of our bodies, but it also radiates out of our bodies. And um, the uh, Roland has done some a lot of science around this, and I think they can get about two or three feet away from the body in terms of like detecting the field. Maybe it's like six feet now. Anyway, as, as magnetometers get better, um, our scientific instruments get better, we can, we can kind of sense it at, at more refined levels. That chakra system and all that, that would be like a hyper, hyper refined level of this. We're just talking about raw electromagnetic energy uh, here. Okay, so the coherent state, the state that we're talking about heart math creating, um, this, is, this is an example of its, of its effect on these different systems of the body. So here you have um, respiration, at the top here. Um, you also have the variability in the heart rate. We'll talk a little bit about what variability in the heart rate is. And then you have the blood pressure rhythm as well. And when you start practicing this quick coherent technique, which is the core technique of heart math, you can see the effect over here. So this quick coherent technique is powerful. And these three windows are just like, are they're like slices into our being. It's like, we can only do really good science when we have really good instruments that can like that can like record this stuff. And so um, anyway, we you know, we get better instruments and we get more sophisticated instruments. We'll be able to slice into like a view, a window into our uh, into this world uh, better. So you can see, um, you know, especially in the heart rate variability here, you can see some of the chaos. It then becomes very regular and everything kind of becomes more regular after they start practicing uh, this quick coherent uh, technique. Uh, when you're thinking, when we're thinking about all of these, all of these uh, systems, um, there are two sides to that electrical system, that nervous system. So the nervous system has the sympathetic and then the, the parasympathetic uh, sim uh, system. So sympathetic uh, is analogous to inhale and parasympathetic would be analogous to exhale. And from uh, listening to Roland for talk about this for a couple hours, it's apparently the the accent in the nervous system is on sympathetic on the inhale and parasympathetic on the exhale. So when you get a good five second rhythm going in your breathing, you're basically balancing sympathetic and parasympathetic. When you think about strong negative events uh, in the nervous system, like a um, uh, a trauma, for example. Um, Let's just say you're in a car crash, okay? And that, that car crash has strong effects on you after. There is some science and some thinking, and perhaps let's just call this a theory at this point, that you it's sort of like you can get stuck on, on one side of this or, or another. Have you ever met someone? I've met lots of people who have had lots of like PTSD and they're very much stuck on the sympathetic side of the system. Sympathetic is like um, the fight or flight side. So um, uh, fight, flight, freeze. Uh, fight or flight is on the sympathetic side and freeze would be on the parasympathetic side. So someone has some post-traumatic stress, they can get kind of stuck to always be kind of like go, 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 go. Have you ever... I don't know, you probably have had experience with people where you where they're just like a little bit more stuck on that kind of excited, they can't seem to really take a deep breath, they can't really seem to calm down like very regularly. So also, you can get stuck on the other side. Have you ever um, had someone who just freezes up because of stress or trauma of some kind? Trauma is just like a word for like really intense, uh, like intense levels of experience that are reflected like in the physiology, right? 
Um, we all have these like different levels. So anyway, um, what's so cool about coherence is that because you're intentionally balancing the signals passing from the heart to the brain in this five second rhythm, and we haven't learned the technique yet, but you're also going to activate some feeling. Um, my shorthand that I use personally, it's not official, is uh, feeling or um, focus, flow, and feeling. Focusing on the heart itself, flow, as in the heart is flowing, or the breath is flowing through here, and then feeling. You activate this positive feeling. We'll get into it in more detail. Focus, flow, and feeling, and um, mostly that just brings the awareness to the heart, and it also uh, activates that the, the hormones that the heart, the positive hormones that the heart does. It does so many different things. They don't even know all the things it does. But anyway, um, when you do this, what's nice is that your vagus nerve is then flooded with the with this coherent electrical signal. And as that passes through the brain, it tends to um, erase or overwrite the emotional loop that that we record in in our hormonal system in so many of our systems. So um, the way I've heard of this, the way I've, the way HeartMath kind of describes this is as a baseline, that we, we all have an emotional baseline. Um, this is something that you can find for yourself. Like I, I started watching um, some political YouTube videos while I was eating breakfast. And, uh, you know, because politics are just so wonderful in, in America and the world right now that, you know, it's usually pretty stressful. But I feel like yeah, it's like my responsibility. I got to like watch this stuff. You know, I got to figure it all out. So I'm eating breakfast and I'm watching this stuff. And if and, and what ends up happening is um, after doing this for like two or three days, what I notice is that when I'm making breakfast, I, I it's like a um, it's like a tape loop that always go, that's always going. Um, think of um, old reel to reel. So uh, before okay, before we had digital audio, we had cassettes, right? And before we had little cassettes, we had big cassettes. And these big, these big reels of electromagnetic um, tape, they are, uh, a reel to reel was like the way you would record like really nice quality sound, like back in like the 70s and the 80s. Okay, it's like we have a loop that is always running. And, and, our, and our environment, it, it's like little signals from our environment are always telling us where we are on the loop. So when I, when I'm going through my loop, and I'm making my breakfast. Now I'm making my eggs. It's like my heart gets a little more fluttery. And and if I and, and it's like my body wants my my being wants to watch those videos, which are like a little stressful. So that would be an example of me writing a little bit of stress into my emotional loop, like on a on a daily basis. And it affects this these two sides, the sympathetic parasympathetic side of the uh, emo of the nervous system. It's kind of like a little more sympathetic. I'm not really relaxed. It's kind of like ah, a little agitation. But what's remarkable to me is that that experience. So I, uh, I, I, I just make breakfast and I'm not even thinking about politics. I'm not even thinking about YouTube or anything like that or watching these videos. And then my body wants kind of wants that. So anyway, that that emotional <clears throat> that baseline that we go through is established through our experiences. And it's kind of like a memory. <clears throat> now, if I sat down and instead I make my breakfast and instead of watching videos, I do five minutes of coherence, and then I eat my breakfast and I did that for a few days, my body would start to anticipate that smooth, um, that's the smooth coherence or the balancing of these two sides here rather than the stress I was introducing through the political videos. So anyway, this is a way of saying that um, we record our emotional experiences um, in our neuro, in our neurology and in our physiology, and we replay it. That's why um, you know when the way it was described to me, that's like how triggers work with post traumatic stress in some 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 sense. This could be at least part of how you might describe it. Is that if uh, you're in a car wreck and it's a red car that hit your car or something like that, you might every time you see a red car, you might <gasps> like. That that's it's kind of like a mechanism that your body is like trying to. It's so it's so basic. It's not logical. It's not like that red car isn't even a fast red car. It's like that's a Prius. That's not gonna wreck into me or whatever. Um, but 
we, we, we take in all of these cues from the environment and we synthesize them. So anyway, when we practice coherence, we tend to flood those pathways of this whole system with this balance. And we can essentially, it's like taking a, a magnetic bulk eraser to that, to that tape. Like you can, you can write a new baseline with this and it takes time. And I got to tell you, uh, there is quite a addiction level component to this because I can like sometimes I know those political videos aren't great for me, but I can be like, Oh, those political videos. Like I want to, I want to lean back into those things. But, um, and it happens with, that can kind of happen with everything. So whatever our, there's the, the system, and I heard this described kind of as the, the, the amygdala system that's, that's watching these pathways. This system is really responsible for change. So when we start to practice coherence, we start to change our inner chemistry. And that can feel uncomfortable. It's like if you, if you practice coherence for a while, you'll tend to kind of push yourself into another state. And there's a part of you that wants to bring you back to the, to the original state. Anyway, a lot of ideas here. Okay, so uh, from Roland's research, um, and this is this is the synthesis of a lot of different a lot of different aspects, a lot of studies. Um, you've got this is a description of the brain and the heart, and what you have is all the blue lines here, all these blue lines. These are the sympathetic connections. All of the yellow lines are the parasympathetic connection. So you've got this connection from the heart back to the brain through the vagus nerve, which is your parasympathetic. Um, you then have some of the, these other ones here through like the spinal cord. And this is the extrinsic, extrinsic cardiac ganglia, very scientific stuff. But anyway, you've got these different, the SA node, the AV node, you've got these, all these different areas uh, in the heart and the brain that science has identified. You also have these things called afferent pathways. Afferent pathways are like, um, are, are feelings within the body of like hunger or, uh, discomfort uh, temperature, discomfort, and these kinds of things. It's kind of like a, the, the feedback uh, mechanism within. So this is kind of more of the, the deeper science. And, um, uh, you know, you, you can kind of see like, and you can see the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic going back and forth here. And there's just, this is a graphic representing a lot of pretty good and deep science. Um, these are some of those afferent pathways. And here you have the, the cerebral cortex. This is the well, part of the brain. You get your amygdala, um, your hypothalamus, your thalamus. Um, it just, olfactory input. So you have like the vagus nerve is giving input, the facial input, like um, seeing a smile on someone's face is going to create a the same kind of smile feeling within yourself. Seeing an angry, argh, like mad, like good actors in movies, they're going to describe those kinds of feelings. And you're going to feel those feelings for yourself. Like, oh, we hate this person or, oh, we, we love this person. Um, anyway, taste input, um, this is different kinds of uh, um, like food poisoning, motion sickness, uh, different kind of vomiting. There's just, anyway, there's just all these different uh, hunger, emotion perception. This is way beyond my scientific understanding. I just wanted to I just wanted to kind of put it out there because it describes uh, the depth of the investigation that's happened. And it's not necessary to practice uh, coherence this way. You can, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily, the experience itself speaks for itself. And this is just the, uh, this is just the science behind it. Okay, so let's take, um, I kind of want to take a break, but I can't really take a break with this, uh, this thing. Although this is not a bad time. All right. Maybe take a little bit of a break here, just so I can kind of regroup. You know what I'm going to do? I am going to, I know I haven't taught you the technique, but I'm going to do a little heart math here as we're talking about it. And I'm going to use this to recenter myself. So I am focusing on my heart. I am feeling my breath move through my heart and I'm activating a positive feeling. I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose the feeling of being in connection with the divine and the wealth of positive feelings that I have thinking about making this video from that place of connection. And I'm going to do that, and I'm going to breathe 
this little curve here. You can do it with me. In at the top, out at the bottom. It feels so good. It feels so good to do, and it and it is. It truly is like a, a recentering. I'm getting, now. I'm getting kind of wound up with just my endless trains of thought here, but it's a great way to recenter. So this is an electrical signal. This would be what an EEG machine, the uh, uh, a machine that can detect the electrical pulse of the heart. This is what you see on all the dramas. Doom, 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 doom. That doom, that, that, that sharp electrical signal, that's the main compression of the heart. And then it's got this little cycle it goes through. So the science behind this and, and what a variability in the heart rate looks like is this. You take, the, you take these pulses and you measure the amount of time between the pulses. So in this case, it's 0.859. In this case, 0.793. In this case, 0.726. And what you do is you graph those. So this is the um, uh, this is the number of seconds that goes by, and this is the the the, the heart rate itself. So if you if you measure this uh, and then and then graph each one of these on the thing, what you see is that the heart is not a metronome. It's not like it's not just a consistent beat the whole time. It's like it's this speeding up and this slowing down. The heart, when it is optimally functioning, like when a person is in a state of flow, when they're focused, when they're when they're tuned in, when things are like going well, that is a that variability in the heart, that that curve that it's riding riding is large. So when people are in health, you see a, you see a large amount of variability. When people are ill and they're they're close to death, there's uh, from an illness, there's very low amounts of variability. Children, you know, when they're healthy and their bodies are vital because they're they haven't you know smoked for twenty years or whatever, and they haven't you know, done all the, added all the other things that adults have sometimes, they are, um, and they're in joy, that they, you see that nice variability curve being very smooth. It's like, and so this can be associated with health. So that's, that's basically what we're talking about with this curve. It's this, it's this change in time. Uh, basically the, 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 here it's, it's basically 70, and then it's 76, and then it's 73. So in that case, it's getting longer, uh, longer in time. Longer in time is going to be like probably dun, 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 on the downward curve, I would bet. If I was guessing. Thinking that in the moment there. Okay, so anyway, let's chart that. So you got this, you got this variability in the heart, and then you're going to chart it. Up here, we've got someone who reports feeling frustration, anxiety, worry, irritation. It's like it's like jagged. And you can use the inner balance and you can actually just see this. You can get one of these guys and you can like look at your own heart rate. And what's so cool or your variability in your heart rate is you can just watch your heart rate go when you're stressed. Then you can do the coherence technique and you can then smooth it out. So you add in that positive emotion, which is adding in that positive hormonal chemistry of the heart. At like for appreciation, love, or care for something that you that you love, 
And then what you do is you do the technique, the quick coherence technique, and then you see your variability get into this nice rhythm. And that nice rhythm is extremely healthy, healing, and positive. I, um, my wife was in the hospital a couple months ago and she was hooked up to all these machines and you could see all of her different, you could see her respiration rate and what she, she knew heart math. And so uh, she was just out of surgery and uh, she's fine, by the way. She was just out of surgery and, and she would just sit there and just focus on that, on, on being in that coherence. And I could watch when she was stressed out, I could watch it go like this and then you can watch it just go, go into a coherence. And it was so beautiful because she essentially tried to stay in coherence as much as possible, which facilitated her healing and her ultimately released from the hospital. Um, but it was so cool because I could just, I mean, this, the machine she was on was really accurate. This is just a couple bucks worth of plastic, but that was like tens of thousands of dollars worth of hardware. And it was just, it was just night. It was just cool to see how her, the variability of her heart rate and her respiration would just like fall into sync and you could see you could see uh so many indicators of of the of this coherent state kind of come across her and if i was if i was looking at her she would just get peaceful and like um and still and more calm and that of course when someone's healing that's the kind of that's the kind of state you want them to be in so again our uh, this is our uh, this this vagus nerve that's kind of feeding up into the brain here um if it's in an incoherent state, you're going to get the brain firing all over the place. And this is what we associate with all of those negative feelings. And then when you get into that coherent state, the brain essentially works together. And creatively, this is like a flow of ideas, a flow of inspiration. From a problem-solving perspective, it's like uh, problems just kind of um, having your whole mental and emotional faculties focused on something it's like you can take apart problems and and see like how they how like what the solution is more quickly. I've had a lot of experiences of just like um, integration, like a aha, like insight when I stay in coherence uh, for a longer period of time, and um, and when I'm thinking about a problem or or something that I'm trying to solve and I'm incoherent, it's a fool's errand. It's like whatever comes out of that state is probably going to have to be rethought anyway. But when I'm really seriously considering it and I can stay in that coherent state for longer periods of time, ride that wave, I, um, I can bring my whole self to the problem and the solutions, the kind of the, the, the way I, I solve it sticks. It, it works better like over time. So this is a, um, a uh, graphic illustrating that electromagnetic field around the heart. And again, they've, uh, I think they've got it up to six feet. I've, uh, I just read a new stat the other day. I can't remember what it was. But um, they've, essentially, it's uh, this, this field, you, it, this, is a, this is a toroidal field. So imagine that it's like a donut, a donut that comes to a point here in the heart. So the reason it's called a torus is if you, if you take a donut, imagine a, a, a donut with a, a donut with a, the circle of the donut comes down to a kind of a point. If you were to take the donut and slice it, it would be a circle, and uh, torus is the name is the Latin name for circle. So if you imagine you take a circle and then you process the circle around, that would create a, a donut shape. And this and this the heart moving like this, it's like a fountain. Um, you know the old mystical metaphors of like the fountain of youth, and um, you know this. It's but that's what it is. And also, if you go to the top of a torus and you you look down at it. Um, as this torus field turns, if you put a if you put a dot on that torus field and you watched it turn, it would basically that there's your spiral. Your spiral of your heart from the top could be following that torus down to that point in the middle and then out the other side. So you can imagine kind of a uh, you can imagine a spiral kind of turning. And that, so when you're talking about our journey of the heart and following that spiral, you follow it into the heart uh, several different ways there. So what's so cool about it, this, this field is that it affects other people. Like, like if I, um, whatever my feeling is, I'm, there's lots of mechanisms for this, but I'm broadcasting that all the time. For ministry, how crazy important is it to be broadcasting peace, love, appreciation, especially when you're on duty as a minister. Like if you're, 
at a wedding, you don't want your minister to be all stressed and frazzled and everything. So, so what's so practical about learning heart math and learning how to be incoherent in coherence is you're basically modeling an optimal state. And in a social setting, like when you have a ritual, like a group ritual, like a wedding going on, it's so important because everybody looks to you as the minister as like, what is the, what's the tone here? What's what's going on? And it's just so disappointing when you're at an event and the minister is just kind of off for whatever reason. So, you know, when I'm like trying to hold a space and I'm like that, I'm that person who's doing it, that officiant who's holding that space. If I can stay in coherence, then I can I can essentially broadcast a very positive physiological state and it will affect everybody uh, around me. In fact, um, Roland has done some uh, experiments with this. They get like 40 people. And so they get like uh, 10 groups of four and they train three people to, uh, for, to like to stay in coherence. And, um, and then they bring in a fourth person into each one of these groups and they don't tell the fourth person about coherence. And what they what they notice is they wear these um, heart these long term heart rate uh, variability monitors. And uh, what they notice is that someone who is out of coherence, so they're in that frazzled state, hangs out with the other people, and the other people are consciously practicing their coherent state. It brings this person into that coherent state. So. Not only is this state broadcast, but it's contagious. So, um, and actually, every, uh, negative and positive states are, are, are contagious. And we just ever ever been um, like walked into a room and there's a bunch of people, and you can kind of you're like, oh, this is a bad meeting. Uh, maybe I'll just wait outside. <laughs> or you walk into a meeting and you're like, oh my god, it feels so good in here. Like this is such a positive kind of feeling. That is related to coherence. All right, bag lease in this example. It could be related to coherence. If the people in that group are practicing coherence, even just a couple of them, they can shift the group through their own uh, insistence that, that they stay in coherence. So this is a strategy that you can use when you're dealing with stressful people or people who are in a state of trauma. Um, I've uh, read accounts of heart math um, practitioners and trainers who will go to... Um, war zones and also to places where there's been natural disasters and they will um they will find people who are in stress strong stress and they can help them practice coherence and when they practice coherence that will um, help them alleviate and not alleviate the effects of stress but it also helps them not um pattern that stress strongly like recorded in that emotional baseline loop i was talking about so it can help it can help De, uh, disperse the, the long-term effects of the stress by getting to them early and having them practice uh, coherence early. So uh, bearing the lead here, let's go ahead and learn the quick coherence technique uh, together. So first you have to come up with a feeling. Uh, here are some examples of feelings. A feeling that brings you into your heart. Uh, well, well, this is a feeling that, um, you know, you just think of like a good movie. A lot of people use their pets for this. Um, these are some words here that can kind of describe it. Care, gratitude, appreciation, honor, enthusiasm, confidence, joy, tolerance, dignity, courage, patience, kindness, and of course, love. So all of those are heart based feelings. And so what you're going to want to do as you practice uh, heart math longer term is you're going to want to come up with a nice little set of DJ records, uh, little feelings. So I can think of a pet. I can also think of a very positive feeling I had on a, on a vacation. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm a, uh, I got my toes in the sand. I'm there on the beach. I've got no stress. It's just like, oh, the world is good and everything is in coherence. I can have a feeling of uh, being in a group of people who I really care about and we're all together focusing on a project and we're, we're accomplishing it. We're like really doing it. There's like this radiant sense of, uh, of joy in my heart. Um, and of course, my personal favorite is just uh, being with God. The feeling and the experience of being with God and just being known and understood and just seen down to my, by, by below my cellular level of just like that love permeating and that love I have for the divine and it being this is reciprocal back and forth. You don't have to get that complicated with it. It could just be my dog <laughs> or something. So you're going to come up with that. You're going to come up with that heart feeling and that's the feeling you're going to, you're going to hang on to. So 
here are the official steps of the quick coherence technique. Um, focus your attention in the area of your heart. Imagine that your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area, breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. The suggestion is to inhale for five seconds and exhale for five seconds, but whatever, whatever rhythm is comfortable is just fine. That's a five second loop, so you can use that to count to five if you want. Step two, make a sincere attempt to experience a regenerative feeling such as appreciation or care for someone or something in your life. The suggestion is to try to re-experience the feeling that you have for someone you love, like a pet, a special place, an accomplishment, or just focus on a feeling of calm and ease. So the quick coherent technique is just those two things, heart-focused breathing and activating that positive or renewing feeling. So here we have on the, uh, on the monitor, we've got the count, the five second count, if you wanna use it. And then you've got, the, you've got the instructions there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, grab my chair here, because I've been standing for a while. I'm gonna sit down with you. And we're just gonna do this for let's say five minutes. We're gonna do this together. So feel free to dive right in there.
So the reason I the reason I have these in frame is that you can keep doing this whenever we're in class, whenever we're talking. It's uh, it's like a nice thing to return to. I find that it's a great way to stay open, stay energized when I'm listening, especially. But also, it's um, a way to integrate. So if I'm trying to digest a big experience, uh, or I've had some big opening, or I'm trying to process some new reality that I'm exposed to, I can um, I can I can do this I can I can do this uh, focus flow and feeling the quick coherent technique, and I can I can kind of bring it back in. Just gonna see how much more daylight we have here. Yeah, we've got some more. Okay. So this, uh, I'm going to teach you this piece now about brain waves and heart math, but really this is gonna make a lot of sense when we get into the journeying piece because the, the, the journeying piece is, is really about this theta state of consciousness. So brain waves, when you hook up a brain, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can measure different areas and different rates of, of, of energetic excitement essentially. And they're organized into these levels um, based on how often the electricity happens. So when the electricity is below four hertz, and a hertz is uh, cycles per second. So if it's below four uh, cycles per second, um, what you're gonna what you're gonna feel is that's 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 deep sleep. That's deep dreamless uh, sleep. Uh, we call that delta. Um, there's no there's a loss of bodily awareness. A theta state is dreams. That's four to eight cycles per second. That sounds like something in there. When you're in that theta state of consciousness, um, it's like deep meditation. Uh, it is a little bit of reduced consciousness. So it does, it does feel kind of dreamy. Most of journeying is about, um, is about being able to dip into that state of consciousness intentionally and then bring it and then bring the results back into an alpha or a beta state of consciousness, which is, um, like an alpha is nine to 13 cycles per second, physically and mentally relaxed, you're awake, but you're a little drowsy. Beta is normally alert consciousness, 14 to 30 cycles per second. And um, a gamma state of consciousness is heightened perception above 30 uh, hertz. Um, there's different ways to shift your brain into these different states of consciousness, but one of the most classic ones is entrainment. So if you have a sound that is in the delta range of consciousness, your brain will tend to drift down to delta. If you're listening to a sound that's in theta, your brain will tend to drift into theta. Same thing with the other states of consciousness. Um, there's different technologies for uh, achieving this with sound. You can also do it with light. So if you have pulsing light, uh, like little LEDs inside of a mask that pulse at a, um, at let's say a, a, a gamma state, you can, you can experience that, um, that state of consciousness uh, through just your brain following the pattern of uh, a flickering light, uh, especially if it flickers very regularly. So let's just think about this for a second. We have a brain and the brain uses electricity. And if it uses it at a slow rate, we're more or less unconscious. We're like, like deep drowsy sleep. It uses it a little bit more and or speeds up a little bit and we're dreaming and just think about what think about how wild a dream is you know you're in another place talking to other people other senses of physics and you know it's dreamy then alpha consciousness like you're just waking up then beta like you're walking around and then gamma i guess maybe i'm not sure about gamma i don't have a i should i should do some more research into that but let's say uh, maybe it's like a highly focused state, like maybe um, you're driving your car and you, uh, I guess if you space out and dream a bit, maybe that's a little bit of theta, but maybe you're thinking about a problem very intensely and you lose track of time. Maybe if you hooked up your brain to an EEG, it would it would it could be in like a gamma or a different kind of state like that. So same brain, different amounts of, of electricity or, or different rates of electricity moving through it, one way of thinking about it, and you get a different state of consciousness. So it's the same us, but like waking and dreaming are very different. So anyway, it's just that there's such a flexibility uh, in the brain. 
what's really cool and the reason I talk about this now is because it, it, it comes, this whole, all this science comes from heart math, comes from Roland's work. So this is a, uh, um, this is the earth thought of as a, as a magnetic system. So um, this is a bar magnet here uh, in, our, in our thing. A bar magnet has a, a north pole and a south pole. And the, way that, the reason we can kind of tell the difference between these two is that um, it, it's a flow. It's basically like a, just like that heart uh, system was that toroidal field. The earth, the earth has a, a, a toroidal field of electromagnetism as well. Um, the, the, the way, the, the theory is that there is a core in the earth and it is liquid, it is liquid metal, and it is spinning very fast. So it's that spinning <clears throat> inner magnetic core that produces the field of electromagnetism. And when you take a compass, a compass is a, is a little magnet and <clears throat> the north side of that compass aligns to the north side of this field because there's a flow to it. There's a flow. The, the, the electromagnetic energy of the Earth is moving, and your compass, basically the reason it lines up to north, is because it is falling in line with that flow uh, uh, as, this, as this system. So if, now let's back up a little bit, and let's think about the sun. This is not to scale. The sun is millions of times larger than the, uh, than the Earth. So the sun has its own core and its own electromagnetic system. And that, produce, and that energy flows out into the solar system. And we call that the solar wind. A solar flare is like a burp of electromagnetic energy out of the sun and creates an intensity in this. Now, the Earth has its own magnetic system. So you can think of the sun-Earth system as a, as a shared system. Uh, the sun is, of course, where all the energy for life comes from. It's the wonderful metaphor for God, essentially, I think, because you're talking about, you know, the, this, this, it's this giving field that shines on everybody equally, and it is the literal source of life. The um, plants uh, take uh, the energy from the sun, they combine it, carbon dioxide, water, sunlight, make sugar. And it's that it's the plants making sugar that animals like us can eat the plants or other animals and, and to get that to get that energy. So literally all the energy of life uh, comes uh, uh, most a lot of it comes from sun. It just has to come from it can also come from heat and like a vent at the bottom of the ocean. But that's um, one way of thinking about that might be that there's that's just the sun acting on a different level, because if the sun, you know, the mag. I'm getting off track a little bit here, but like the earth, the earth, you know, is held in, in a, in a gravity orbit with the sun. And without that, you'd never have any, there wouldn't be any conditions for life. The, it's the cycle around the sun. It's the pattern of day and night and day and night being so regular for so many billions of years that gives us life. Okay. So we have our own kind of magnetic field uh, that, that interacts with the sun. And here's a video. So here, here, here you got this from NASA. You've got some, you've got this energy, uh, electromagnetic energy, the solar wind being ejected from the sun. And that travels out into space. You can see like little sunspots here. Uh, and then that energy basically interacts with the magnetic field of the earth. And what ends up happening is when there's a lot of it, you can kind of see there's this, there's this folding back effect. Where this, where this energy is being transmitted um, through this magnetic system of the Earth, and it's going to pinch off over here. And when that electrical potential snaps back, it snaps back and it creates uh, the aurora borealis on the north and the south poles of the planet. And um, you can see that as like a kind of a glowing uh, effect in the atmosphere. So this is a picture of the aurora borealis, and that uh, that electromagnetic uh, color that it's a, called an ionic discharge. And I, I, an ion is like an, a, a, an electron that is being excited. And, it, 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 and when it's excited a lot and in a certain way, it creates light. And that's what we see as like the colorful northern lights. And the more power the sun puts out, the more energy we get in the northern lights and the further south and north are from the South Pole perspective, um, that, that electromagnetic aurora borealis extends. Now here's the cool part about, um, about heart math, and I just want to kind of touch on this. So you've got this solar radiation, and you have this, this band 
uh, called the ionosphere. You can barely see it on this image. But you also have, uh, it, this is the ionized gas of the atmosphere. You have lightning strikes. There's always a lightning strike. <clears throat> There's thousands of them, hundreds of them going on all the time on the Earth. And all of that electrical discharge, plus um, these things called Whistler waves, uh, plus that other effect I was showing you, creates these things called Schumann resonances. Now, Schumann resonances, uh, you can plot them on this little graph right at, down here. This is an eight hour, this is an eight hour period. And when you, when you plot the Schumann resonances of the Earth itself, you get these little peaks. And these little peaks are wildly coherent with these states that we've identified as primary to human consciousness. So what's so cool about Roland's work, and this is a, pardon me, <clears throat> this is a set of work called the Global Co uh, Coherence Initiative, GCI. This thing is proving a two-way communication between human consciousness and the planet and the solar system both ways. It, the, the electromagnetic um, effects of the, of the solar system, think of um, the way Roland described it to me one time, is think of, the, uh, think of the Earth rotating every 24 hours with these little electromagnetic bands around it, and think of the solar flare, uh, think of those as like guitar strings, and think of the solar wind as like plucking these guitar strings. So as the Earth turns, doom, 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 the, uh, these, these strings are getting plucked, and the, that plus some other electromagnetic effects from the shape of the Earth produce these peaks in resonance. Now, it's so interesting because um, if you, the science Roland is doing is um, getting large numbers of, or groups of people to consciously be in coherence and move into different kinds of resonances and then to measure the magnetism of the Earth. And what he's shown is that when people stay in resonance, stay in a heart coherent field, they affect the electromagnetic fields of the earth. And those, those electromagnetic effects are contagious. That, that actually we, we are receiving magnetic energy and magnetic tempo from our solar system and from our earth. And we are also giving it back with our response. So I just wanted to I just wanted to kind of just drop that seed here, and we can unpack that in further and in future uh, kinds of things. Um, so, I just want to. I think I think I'm going to have to stop there. I'm, I'm I, I started a little bit late in the day, and I'm running out of juice. But so when we come back, we're going to uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, we just went through the heart math piece. We're going to be talking about journeying and the classic. Uh, core, sh uh, core shamanism, the, the cross-cultural anthropological studies that Michael Harner did back in the 70s. And we'll talk about his early initiations. We'll talk about the practice of shamanism in the West these days. And we'll talk about how that can be a tool that you can use to explore um, your own uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness and also to connect with your own spiritual guidance, uh, your own personal spiritual guidance, and how that can be used as a tool to, um, to connect with um, the source of love inside of you, which is what I am proposing is one of the core functions of the minister. Uh, so thank you so much for being with me and thank you for um, sticking with it. And um, I am just really looking forward to more conversations. This is a, this is a one way kind of communication. Like I'm just telling you a bunch of stuff here. This has got to be, and this is part of a, that map. So when you go to that map, what you'll see is, for lack of a better term, office hours. So all these concepts and all these ideas that I talk about and I bring up in here, these are starting points where we can have conversations about these things. And ultimately, these are experiences that you can have for yourself. So uh, learning is not only just hearing the information, but it's actually applying it. Um, like a trade. So if we think of ministry as a trade, it is something that we have to practice, we have to learn the skills, and then we have to actually have to put it into effect in the world. Um, and then get feedback, and then improve and iterate our, our approach to it over time. So blessings on digesting everything uh, we've talked about so far. And this is a on-ramp to a much 
more in-person and live conversation that we can have in a lot of different ways. So thank you very much. And uh, God bless you on um, getting closer to the divine. Take care.